This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to our sunset safari. We've just seen a number of elephant tracks across the road. So hopefully we have some luck with finding elephant this afternoon. My name is Byron and on camera with me is Senzo this afternoon. Um, we have got Steve and Sebastian on the other vehicle and then Taylor is going to be walking with Fergs and then of course Louise and Jenna in the final control. Um, so no school drive this afternoon unfortunately but remember please still send us your questions and your comments hashtag safari live via twitter is how you do it otherwise comment in the youtube window and we'll gladly answer your questions and we always love hearing from our viewers so it's a warm afternoon today very very warm afternoon uh it's about 28 degrees celsius so that's quite warm it uh oh dear I've forgotten the fahrenheit I thought it was about 92 fahrenheit i think um or is that too hot Ah, beg your pardon, that's too, that's too hot. It's 83, 83, I was close. 92, 83, what's 11 degrees? So, <laughs> 83 degrees Fahrenheit, it's 28 degrees Celsius. Very, very warm winter afternoon. You wouldn't believe it's winter out here, actually. Although, when you look at the bush and you see how dry it is, then you can definitely notice it is winter. No rainfall for quite some time. But that's typical for winter in this area. Now we had a really exciting morning this morning. We had two prides of lions. We had a lot of elephant around. So there was lots of great things found on our sunrise safari this morning. Now, unfortunately, the one pride of lions, uh, the, uh, the Torchwood pride, which I haven't seen before, actually moved north onto Biffle's Hook, so we won't be able to see them again. But perhaps we can get a, a glimpse of that pride that Taylor had. They were in a really difficult position. We didn't have great signal with them, but I think it was the sticks pride that Taylor had this morning, which is really exciting. Also, have not seen them for quite some time. So there were lions around. Um, but we'd like to try and find a leopard this afternoon. Well, I would, that's for sure. Otherwise, we'll just see what we can find. There was some monkeys alarm calling around camp this morning. We investigated, we didn't find anything, but perhaps we have some luck this afternoon. As I said, I'm not the only one out, um, and there's a... A person with a long blonde ponytail is going to be walking this afternoon. Yes, I am going to be walking. I had to just check for a minute. I was like, am I walking or am I driving a car? Anyways, my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Ferg. And then we've got the mighty Ephraim assisting us on the bushwalk this afternoon. Now... Those of you that were watching on the dam cam, you may have seen a beautiful herd of elephants come and drink at the pan. How nice was that? Wasn't it wonderful? And the bull lingered for a little bit. We're not going to be doing any lingering this afternoon. We are going to march because it's a race against the clock. I think it, I don't know if it was Steve or if it is Byron that's going to look for the elephants. But I know one of them said that they might head that way. So our goal this afternoon is to try and march quicker than them using animal pathways. And hopefully we'll intercept those large grey giants before either one of they do. Um, I think it would be very, very nice to, of course, interact with some elephants on foot. Maybe see, I don't know, what they get up to. We know they had a drink, so I'm sure they'll just be feeding. But perhaps they stop along the way and we dig some water. Uh, they did go down Twin Dams Road, so they could be down in the Mulwati drainage system where the grass is nice and green on the edges of the banks. And then, well... Lots of nice green leaves. Well, we have an obstacle. See, even on a bushwalk, you can have a roadblock. And in the very, very far distance, you can see three wildebeest. That's surely not the whole herd. There's been quite a big group of them hanging around. So we'll have to navigate our way past those savage beasts. Of course, they're not savage. They're quite funny. I think that they will probably just run away. Anyways, let's go to Steve before his hornbill flies away. Well, thank you, Taylor. Good afternoon, everybody. We've got a southern red-billed hornbill that is running around on the ground now, scoffing up whatever insects he can find. 
Moments before, he was using that very long, curved beak to scratch through a pile of impala dung, looking for whatever insects might be living there inside. And you can see the competing there a little bit with the turtle dove, albeit the turtle dove is looking for seeds exclusively and not for little insects. A little bit of a scratch underneath the shoulder from time to time. You can see how the use of their feet enable them to forage quite successfully. Or oh, one becomes two, just like that. A foraging party of birds on the floor. And as Byron said, it is winter indeed, and the birds are scratching out a very difficult living for themselves. Welcome again. My name is Steve Falkenwich, joined on camera by Sebastian Rombi, and we are out in Juma in the Sabi Sands, and who knows what we might find. If you have not been enticed to, please send through your questions and comments to hashtag Safari Live. Follow us on YouTube stream. Whatever platform you do so require, we are going to move on from our foraging birds see if we can find any other animals this afternoon how are we doing ladies and gentlemen it's a lovely day this side I'm wearing shorts in the afternoon I don't think it's going to be too cold this evening but then the long the shortest day of the year has just passed that only gets better from here well apparently it actually gets a bit colder have we got some crested Franklin here Crested Franklin, another species that likes to scratch around. There's a water thickney in the middle of the shot. He's hiding. No, it's a spotted thickney. Very big eye. He's just hiding in the shade. Oh, doesn't want to go. He snuck away. So a beautiful little bird party we have here. All trying to scratch out their different type of a living on the vegetation and whatever there might be around. The Franklin that you can see there, the crested uses its feet to scratch the ground not only does it run around like the others you've just seen it's a lot quicker on the ground than the other two very chicken like they've almost given up flight altogether they do still fly and the hornbill does a bit more of a waddle it doesn't look as as well versed on foot but then oh okay it covers some good ground but there would be a bit of comp oh munch 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 so they are scratching a living out of, here we go, found some more dung, turn it over, let's see what's underneath. Oh, it's wonderful to see birds running around and doing their thing. And they do move quite quickly, don't they? <laughs> Romit the Hornbill walk looks like the Mr. Bean walk, I think. I'm not sure if you want me to look like Mr. Bean. But maybe a little bit later in the show when we, we're lacking a little bit of content and we might need a bit of humor to spark us all back in. And it looks like a little bit of the Mr. Bean. If you are not familiar with Mr. Bean, ladies and gentlemen, you need to entertain yourself, enlighten yourself. Rowan Atkinson was a very funny comedian. And there we go. As the hornbill disappears behind the magic worries, we are going to... We are going to disappear down the road and from one comedic legend to another. It's still jumping in there. We just, well, there's a woodpecker. Everyone, sorry, I'm just chatting to Senzo a woodpecker, and there was also a grey headed bushrike that just uh, flew off. I was hoping to show you that grey headed bushrike. Let's try to see what woodpecker that is. Oh no, it's gone now, isn't it? Typical. <laughs> there goes the grey-headed bushrike off to the right. Hold on, let's see. Maybe we can get a view of it. Hold on, send me try. Got anything there? No, no. Apparently Taylor has been trying to show you this bird for some time. Well, let's quickly try get it. Uh, hold on. Where is it? Did it move already? They very tricky to to view. They tend to fly off quite quickly, and they hide in quite dense bush. The grey-headed bush shrike. Let me try to find a photo for you quickly. Just going to have a look and see. If maybe this this bird pops out for us. And it's such a beautiful. 
Did you see something, Sensor? Oh, there's the tail through there. Well done, Sensor. Let's just have a look. Um, no, oh, there, there it is. Well done. Great. The grey-headed bushrike. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful bird. You see that wonderful yellow coloration underneath, that very prominent grey head, and off it goes. It just took off. Uh, wonderful. Well done, Senzo. That's great. That's a nice little surprise. Grey-headed bushrike. It's got that wonderful call. Um, they call it the ghost bird in, in Afrikaans, uh, local language sp spoken here. Yeah. They call it the ghost bird because of a call that it gives. It's call, it, it basically goes... And that, did it fly away again now? Uh, <laughs> very cool sound, very cool call, the grey, go away, I'm sorry, not the grey, go away, mate. the grey-headed bushrike. <laughs> See, I start getting confused with all these bird names. Now, um, we don't have an official school drive this afternoon, but uh, one of my friends and guests that come on safari with us every year, um, she's a teacher and she's got her school watching, uh, which is great. They always watch when they can, and I think it's their last day before they go on holiday, so the kids are all excited. Um, at Jefferson School in New York and Mrs. Rizzuto's class. Good afternoon to all of you. It's always nice to have you with us. Um, you can ask Mrs. Rizzuto to send some questions through and we'll answer them for you. And then enjoy your holiday. I'm sure you kids are all looking forward to the holidays. Uh, Karen, my favorite time of the year, now I'm trying to think, you know, I must be honest, I enjoy, I enjoy kind of April, May, June in the bush. For me, that's always a wonderful, wonderful time because the temperature has started to change. It's not blisteringly hot, which it can get sometimes up in the bush. Um, it's still pretty green. Okay, now we've got into this dry season, but... April, May, it's still reasonably green. Uh, there's, I mean, yeah, I would, I would say that's probably my favorite time of the year um, to be in the bush. April, May, uh, going into June. I enjoy winter a lot. Um, but then again, you know, I think of uh, December, January, green, lush, uh, very warm. You often get those beautiful rainstorms. Uh, it's it's difficult, but I'd, I'd have to I'd have to choose April May if I could if I had to pick one season or one time. So that autumn April May is usually autumn for us down here. That's a great time of year for me. Now I haven't had any luck with those elephant yet. I think they were actually moving the opposite direction down to one of the water holes. Um, so they may have had a drink and maybe Steve or Taylor has some fun with or have some luck finding the elephant I'm um, just having a look and uh, give me a second I'm just gonna jump off here quickly I'd like to show you something so while we're driving around there's always little signs that we might use to help find animals now this is a great one um, so if you have a look there's a branch in the road and just having a look around I can also see a nice elephant track it doesn't look like a particularly fresh elephant track because I can see some animals have walked over the track over there now this elephant judging by the track was actually walking in that direction it looks like a male a large male I don't see any other tracks around um, Although, no, it looks like possibly a male by himself. And it looks like he was walking that way. And I say that because with the track, you can see as the elephant steps, it basically drags its foot and it kicks forward. So you can see that forward little kick leaves a mark in the sand and that's the direction they're going. And the other thing I can see is, if I have a look here, let me just pop this on the bonnet. Hold on a second. I want to show you this. It's quite interesting. Now this is also quite dry, so I can also tell that it was quite a while since that elephant walked past you. But that elephant 
basically picked this branch, broke this branch. Um, it's a bush willow off of a tree, one of the bush willows here, and chewed on it. And I can see, if you have a look, <clears throat> look how this elephant has chewed these branches completely to try and get the bark off. And you can see, so this, possibly most of this was in the elephant's mouth at some point. Isn't that cool? Um, but as I said, it is dry, so it's been a while, or been lying on the ground for a while. Um, but the elephant definitely chewed on this. You can see even the leaves, <coughs> um, even the leaves have been chewed on. So that's interesting. So lots of signs out in the bush to, to help us find these animals. All right, well, I'm going to carry on. Let's go see if we can find them. Now, it sounds like Taylor has discovered some insects. Not ones that are alive. Well, there are a couple moving that are alive. But it, this is the most bizarre thing. So I've been trying to get a decent view of it. I think you're going to have a much better view than, than I will. But there's obviously a tunnel of sorts over there. You can see there's a couple of ants coming out. And... I don't know where all the dead ants have come from. Yes, those are body parts that you're looking at. Those are heads of ants that you can see. Now, I, I don't know if these are other ants that they've eaten, if they are they have a burial chamber. It's the most bizarre thing that I've seen. I don't think I've quite seen so much, but it's obvious that they don't want it inside their mounds anymore, so they've dumped it out here. So that's what these ants have been doing all day long. It's like a spring clean, I suppose. But I'm trying to think, because I, I was wondering, I was like, maybe it's termites heads, because we know ants and termites are sometimes uh, at war with one another. We too often see the Matabele ants versus the harvester ants. And then the other night we had a big sugar ant that had walked on in an area, and, well, the other little ants around it weren't too happy about that. They were biting its legs. It was, it was quite cool to see. So they don't necessarily like one another. But I, I think those are too small to be termites. The termites have sort of fairly, fairly broad heads. But it must maybe an ant of another species. So I'm trying to get down like really low to actually see what's gone on here. That is insane. I really can't explain this. I don't like I said. I don't know if it is other if the ants from the colony or if they've eaten them. It is so strange. But uh, either way, they don't want it inside the colony underneath the ground, and they're disposing it on the outside. Because at first I thought maybe it's just soil or something that's around there, and then I, you know, dabbed my finger on the remains and and picked it up. Let me actually do that again. It's quite interesting. Actually, let me lick my finger. That'll make them stick nicely. And seeds. There's all sorts of things here. Lots of seeds. And then you can see those are heads. You can see some of them you can actually sort of see. It's bizarre. It's weird. There's a variety of different things here. I can see, sh I like, but yeah, there's all little, obviously there's granules from the sand, but there's lots and lots of different things. So it's somewhere they must have an area where they obviously get rid of what they don't want anymore. Like so whether it's the husks of seeds or, uh, or anything else that they're feeding on, if they're also carnivorous and feasting on other insects, they'll take their exoskeletons and I suppose dump them in a site. And now they're emptying the dustbins. Amazing though. Really, really quite cool to see. I'm trying to think of this one where you can see the little antennas. Huh, huh. Anyways, nature is so fascinating, isn't it? Anyway, we got distracted because I thought that was quite interesting. We're going to keep on walking. And uh, we haven't seen any signs of these elephants just yet. Not one track on the road. Where are they gone? I don't know. Maybe they've actually not used the roads whatsoever. And they've decided to actually go down and use some animal pathways. I might have to just stand quietly and just listen to see if I can't hear any branches breaking. Anyways, we're going to keep on going and hope to find those elephants. Yes, well, thanks, Taylor. How interesting. Headless ants. Um, it's been known in certain colonies for individuals to sort of sacrifice themselves when the population gets to a certain level and food resources start diminishing and then the body then gets eaten and the heads which are probably too full of chitin get deposited outside so maybe that's what happened a mass suicide for the benefit of the whole colony well, those sort of things do happen 
just wondering if that is the case there. But here we have got some very beautiful uh, Birchall starlings that are also running around like the hornbill on the ground, trying to scratch out a living. Their ability to walk as well makes them very adaptable on the ground. And as Ralph was talking about the other day, you can see how when they move, their feathers go from black to green to blue. It was from the carotenids in the feathers. They are not actually green or blue at all. It is just the way that the light reflects off of, off of sort of pigments inside of the feather combined with melanin. Melanin is the black, which makes it very hard and keeps the feathers for a long period of time. And here we're seeing a little bit of inter-specific competition as the hornbill and the starling compete for a similar resource. And inter-specific means between the species. So that is what's led to the enormous amounts or differences in beak length, beak size, beak shape, leg length in birds, size, all sorts of things between the species that has sort of diverged them all to the level that we have today so that you can have birds like this competing on the ground and yet not actually competing directly so there's sort of a, an overlap but then there's still the ability you see there the hornbill able to scratch and dig probably a little bit better at accessing the food than the starling the starling having to physically run along the ground whoopsie there he does the mr bean walk again Starling having to physically run around and catch the prey where the hornbill can turn things over I've learned that and those of you on the baboon walk with me this morning Will see that these birds are having to also scratch a living out of seemingly nothing it takes time it takes patience and the adaptability of their beaks is what allows a lot of these birds to spend the entire winter months here Bearing in mind we are only in the middle of winter now. There are still many, many months to go until the rains come. And even if the rains come, they can quite often be late. And that is where the strength and the survival of the fittest comes in. Marvelous that we can talk about birds and keep all interesting. There we go. Beautiful. You can see not the... The Cape Glossy Starling looks quite similar, but doesn't have the black eyes. Got that orange eye, and the tail is not long as that. It's also got a little bit lighter sort of blue color to it. Very long tail, Birchall Starling. And as you go further north in the Kruger, this bird completely changes into another species, which you find only in the northern Kruger, called the Meave Starling, which has got a tail twice as long as this one. But then there's a specific line where the Birchall starling do not go further north and the Meaves do not come further south. That's a sort of partitioning. That's where competition hits a sort of barrier and the species completely outcompete each other. So you won't find the one there and the other one will be there in dominance. So always very interesting, I think. Hmm. Nostridge, well, the difference between bush shrikes and shrikes, I'll have to get my app out for you, but the, the bush shrikes all join a family which is related to the sound that they make. Um, so they are quite sort of cryptic and they like to hide in the bushes and their, their calls, I must just get the scientific name because it explains it. The, the, the genus name that they've been given is all about their cryptic nature and their sort of the way that they call in the bushes because like the nyal and the kudu that occur in quite thick vegetation the bush shrikes hence the name bush shrikes occur in relatively thick vegetation they're quite skulky they're quite difficult to find jumping around in the vegetation whereas other shrikes you quite often find more, more in open areas they're a lot more sort of obvious to find whereas the bush shrikes are more you hear them more than you see them and obviously technology is very slow today. It is coming. So, what is this? You don't remember the scientific name, do you, Seb? Oh, sorry. Of the Bushrikes. The, the name, the genus name, uh, completely sorry. refers to how their calls are. Because the, the orange-breasted Bushrike makes a very loud... <laughs> okay, here we go. Koloff. Colorophenus. Colorophenus, okay, all referring to the fact that they make a very sort of loud call. The gray headed bushrike is a very. 
And the difference really is in the fact that these birds, um, what's the word? These birds make a call that carries through the bush for territorial behavior and you're not really seeing them. For example, this one, my favorite of the bush rikes, have a listen to my hat. Yes, I love this call. That is the call of the gorgeous bush rike. And I'm going to show you his picture here on the dash. Hopefully we can get him in a nice shot without there being too much glare. That is the gorgeous bush rike, ladies and gentlemen. And all parts of the same family. And they're very difficult to find. Um, they do respond to calls. Here we go. Gorgeous bush rike. I wasn't making up that name. This is my favorite bush rike. So you hear them calling more than you see them. And the normal shrikes that we find, the other shrikes, don't have much of a sort of carrier call. They, they're generally open land specialists. They're all part of the Lanier family. Uh, they all impale their predators or their prey, should I say, for ripping them apart. Bush rikes will do something similar in that regard. But because they're colorful, they're beautifully colored. Orange-breasted, the gray-headed, the gorgeous, you saw that they're all beautifully colored. And they live in very thick vegetation. So that's essentially the major difference I don't know I don't know what other bush rikes there are across the world I only know the African ones but I see it as well and I think Byron has spotted it and would like to talk to you about the smoke on the horizon that looks very far away um, I think that's possibly coming from the Kruger boundary or maybe on Mala Mala I'm not sure now it's not too much of a concern I tell you why is because a lot of um, or around this time of year people do controlled burns so they would start that fire intentionally and the reason for that is to basically burn and get rid of a lot of dead and decaying plant material and what it does is it then returns a lot of nutrients back into the soil and as soon as we have good rains the bush transforms and will get a really really green blanket of grass growing and all the plants get those nutrients back into into them again which is really fascinating fire is a very important tool for managing land um, and landscapes it's, and obviously natural fires occur um, all over the world out here we've got to be a little bit careful with natural fires we've got to manage them so they do controlled burns so they'll burn different sections every year and then rotate and you can see that smoke rising through the air <laughs> So we haven't had too much luck with any of the animals just yet. Um, been looking for the um, the elephant, no luck, but we'll carry on and see what we can find. Maybe try to find some of the smaller things and talk about them. It was interesting that Taylor had those ants that were dead. Now, um, I know Mrs. Rizzuto's class are all asking a lot of questions. Hang on, you know what we've got here? And these are always beautiful to have a look at. Some beautiful male impala. I think sometimes we take the impala for granted. They really are beautiful antelope. And wonderful to see. Now this is a bachelor herd. So just the males move around together. And then at certain times of the year, usually around April, May, they start the rutting season and they'll fight one another for dominance and then mate with females. But for the rest of the year, they stay together, which is quite interesting. But they are beautiful antelope and a good food source for a lot of animals. Uh, most of the predators hunt the impala. So just as well the impala are in abundance, they do very, very well in, in this greater Kruger area. There are thousands of impala and a very good food source for the predators. Everything from cheetah to hyena, wild dog, uh, leopards and lions all hunt in parlor. <laughs> That's really cool. So, uh, Mrs. Lapwing, you were worried about the the fires and the the animals. What do they do during these controlled fires? 
all the animals were, are able to get away from the fires. I don't think I've ever seen an animal, unless it's a huge fire, which is, um, which might be a natural fire caused by lightning or something that, that is out of control. I haven't seen animals get injured by fire before these controlled burns. They just move out of the area. That's all. Um, you know, the animals have an incredible uh, survival instinct which kicks in. So they know exactly how to deal with that. So there's absolutely nothing to worry about with the, with the animals. As I was saying earlier, there's uh, Mrs. Rizzuto's class is asking a lot of questions about different animals um, and things that we get in Africa. Maybe I can try to answer them all together. Um, I think Emma was wondering about interesting animals that I had seen. Uh, or one of the most interesting animals. I think recently, uh, some of you know, I was just in Rwanda and I, uh, I got to see the mountain gorillas. And hold on, there's a beautiful bird and wonderful light on it up at the top. Let's just have a quick look at that. A lilac breasted roller. Isn't that beautiful? Definitely one of the prettiest birds that we get out here, but possibly the harshest call. Um, now, Steve was chatting about the bush shrikes and their calls. Now, this uh, lilac breasted roller just has a harsh, harsh screech almost. It's, uh, it's not a very attractive call at all. But beautiful bird, very, very beautiful bird. Now, they enjoy feeding on insects. A lot of insects. I've actually seen one of these lilac breasted rollers catch a mouse, which is, uh, it, it was quite funny and interesting to watch. It caught the mouse, killed it, and tried to eat it, but the mouse was just too big and it couldn't swallow, so eventually it had to spit it out and then it flew off. Too bad for the mouse, but uh, but very interesting. Usually these birds catch insects, so to go for something that large just shows you how opportunistic they are. They'll go for just about anything. Hmm. Lovely. So there's always birds to chat about too. Um, so as I was saying uh, about the gorillas, the mountain gorillas, they amazing animals, powerful, powerful animals, and that's definitely one of the most interesting creatures I've seen recently. Um, and for quite some time, uh, beautiful, beautiful animals. Oh, there's a little red crested Koran. Hold on. Let's just see if we can find it. Can you see it? Oh, it's coming back. There we go. Uh, Tanya, you were apparently hoping to hear a black-bellied bustard, but you say maybe the Korhan is a is a close second. I think so. There it goes. I just want to double check. Yeah, it's a red-crested Korhan, just hiding through the grass there. Very, very well camouflaged. Nice to see it though. Now they do this beautiful display, um, the red crested Koran, as, a, as they take off when the males are trying to uh, attract the female, they'll take off, they'll shoot r right up into the air. And as they do that, they basically do a little backflip, they stop flapping their wings, they do a little backflip and they r almost roll the whole way around and then they flip forward again and they parachute down to the ground. Um, now, I've seen that many, many times before, but something I've never seen is if the female is very, very close, the male will land on the ground and then he does this little dance. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, but he does this little dance. He dances around the female and he tries to attract her. So it's... <laughs> It's really interesting, <laughs> but I've never seen, I've only seen a video clip of it. I've never seen the male actually do it. So beautiful birds that love to display. You never know, you never know. Um, all right, well, it seems to be, to me, that uh, the Taylor's finding a lot of dead animals today. 
That's courtesy of the Nkuma lines, thank you very much. But uh, we have a much smaller buffalo skull. And um, I really, after seeing this as like an African pygmy buffalo, I always say that it's so, so small in comparison to that big set of horns that we found, even just the skull. And this was a really, really old bull. Oopsie, sorry, book. You can even just see by the tips of the horns, look how blunt they are exceptionally smooth. Now, the other boy was an older boy, but I still think he was in the prime of his life, whereas this battle, uh, this battle, this buffalo, <laughs> I make up words often, this buffalo um, uh, definitely, definitely was right at the edge of his lifespan and probably lived a very, very full life. Um, so we ended up measuring last night the size of the horns of that other buffalo. And remember how we always talk about the Roland Wards and a Roland Ward is... It's a hunting thing, which we're not going to go into. However, they obviously have trophy animals. And um, they give you a list of measurements. And the water buck horns that we had also were, that were killed by lions, of course, hunted in a more natural fashion, um, were um, also made of rolling wood. And then the buffalo, the buffalo was, I, I've never seen such a big buffalo in South Africa. And just from well, up close and personal, anyways, those horns measured 42 and a half inches. That's big. And that was basically measured from the outer width of the horn. So from here to here. So that's how wide they were. This one is, this is tiny. This is probably only about maybe 70 or 80 centimeters or so. So uh, quite a bit smaller, in fact, in comparison to the other one. And just, like I said, just the size of the skull even. But again... Probably the lions, most likely the Inkahumas. We've seen them here quite a few times. And as we start to walk through, you'll see a few remains lying about. Now, I think that this buffalo was killed many, many years ago. Even long, long, more... What is wrong with me? I don't know where all my words have gone all of a sudden. I was so excited to tell you about this buffalo and that we measured the horns that now I can't even speak. Let me take a moment. I don't really think this buffalo was killed before the other one. As the hyenas have come through here... And there's virtually nothing left. A couple of vertebrae here and there hidden in the grass, but I don't see any big rib bones starting to pop up every now and then. But otherwise, there's not much around at all. Anyways, we were just talking about the great waterbuck, and it seems as though Steve must have known. Indeed, a very live one. In fact, this one is even chewing. Well, it was chewing. Bit of an itchy nose. The flowers are quite unpleasant today. Hmm, that's quite a nice nose you have there, sir. Absolutely beautiful specimen, this waterbuck male. He was sitting down ruminating when we arrived. He's now stood up. There's a little bit of wind that's picked up this afternoon. And no doubt that is flustering him a little bit because he doesn't want to turn into just a waterbuck skull. He would like to remain with his skull attached to the rest of his body. This is evident of the waterbuck skull and the buffalo skull that Taylor has found. Unkuhuma prides make very short work of animals like this. Yes, Karen, he is a fantastic specimen. Those horns are about as good as they get. Very mature male. And you can also tell a very mature male because they're quite often on their own. Quite often on their own in their little territory. Not far from water, this guy. He's only about 80 meters from tree house, uh, from Twin Dam watering hole. Constantly alert. Carla, he has got fantastic horns, and you can see those ridges on the horns. Um, if you've seen impala horns, there's a similar sort of thing to it. Those ridges help in catching the horn of the of an individual when they fight, uh, prevents it from slipping. If those horns are just smooth, like the tips there, smooth like that, the horn slips. But on the ridge itself, the horns actually catch and enables the, the individuals to put their entire weight into the combat without it slipping down. And if they're good, they can hold the other one at bay. If they're not good, the horn of the opponent will slip past. What have you spotted there, sir? What have you spotted? Can't see anything. Might just be 
Something ferreting around in the grass. We'll keep our eyes peeled, though. Definitely got his attention. He's trying to smell it. As his tail works non-stop. Keep away the flies. No flies there, please. <laughs> there we go. He's waving hello. <laughs> Oh, he's not. He's... Hmm. Zach, that's a misnomer. A lot of people think that. It's not a true story. I've seen lions eating two of these at the same time. Essentially what it is, is the waterbuck with that very shaggy coat has got a sort of an oil or a gland on their skin that they're able to secrete an oil which keeps the fur sort of dry, similar to that of what ducks or geese or birds will do to keep their feathers dry. The water buck can secrete that and it's got a bit of a musty sort of smell to it and apparently it doesn't taste very nice. But um, I've never seen lions shying away from eating a water buck. You can ask the skull we have back at camp what the lions thought of him. They thoroughly enjoyed him. Um, I have spoken with people in the past about it, people who've dealt with water buck carcasses and they say that if you are careful with the meat, if you don't touch the meat after you've touched the, the fur, then you can keep the flavor of that off. But it does have quite a foul smell and quite a foul taste. But it doesn't affect lions. Lions will eat it. We've had Tundi eating a youngster. Tundi's the leopardess of the area. We've had her eating a youngster. I've had many leopards in the past feeding on medium-sized to small water buck. So I don't think, you know, they see an animal that's moving and they're not very picky in their movements and their di discretion. Bearing in mind, these animals will also eat on a four or five day old rotting giraffe. <laughs> the panic in Louise's voice. <laughs> right, we're here. And uh, I was thinking of my lines. I was going, hmm, how am I going to? How am I going to sound really cool introducing this? And then we were both caught off guard. Anyways, we're surrounded by giraffe, or almost surrounded by giraffe. It's the most giraffe I've seen in a number of weeks. Should I dare say months? It's been a while. But we've got seven giraffe, even though you can't see them all. It's pretty cool that we get to experience them on bushwalk. Now, we could hear some strange noises. Obviously, our plan was always to find the elephants, and then unfortunately. Unfortunately, the elephants have given us the slip. I can't believe it. We haven't found one track, but we did find lots of tracks of giraffe, which was great. Then we could hear these strange sounds in the bushes, and we couldn't work out what they were saying. Is it maybe rhinos? It doesn't sound like an elephant feeding. Maybe it's a buffalo. Maybe it's a giraffe was the other option. We had been seeing their tracks, but not any of their tracks that sort of led us over here. And they don't seem to mind us at all. They've obviously heard us coming because we have been chatting away a little bit. And they're fairly relaxed. I mean, I think that, that, guy, that youngster is not so sure of us, but the others is a cow, a couple more bulls, another cow, another big bull. Not very far away. And I'd be very, very chuffed if I had some guests with me on foot. There is absolutely no way I'm doing the giraffe roll. Uh, the Ralph roll is what we should call it. Nah, I can't steal his thunder. Uh, the, the giraffe roll, <laughs> says Ferg. <laughs> I like that. So no, I don't think I'll be doing that. Um, but it's nice just to stand here and fairly close. And especially in the thicket, I thought they would have been a little bit more wary of us because they haven't got a, you know, a clear view of us. And we've come from the drainage line, so it was exceptionally dense. But they don't mind. And we're moving around. I mean, I'm not even whispering. Like I said, and like we always say, it's very, very difficult to try and sneak up on a giraffe. If you can get that right, that's amazing. And you should get bragging rights and some kind of award. I don't actually know anybody that's ever successfully been able to sneak up to a giraffe within, you know, just a couple of meters without it knowing that you were there. They always spot you from a distance. It was like this morning with the sticks pride. We saw them and I thought, and I, and I said to Senzo, I was like, these lions, they're looking at something in this thicket. I was wrong. It wasn't in the Tamboeti thicket or the drainage. It was all the way on the other side. They'd seen the giraffe. But the joke was on the lions because the giraffe had also seen the lions coming from all the way away. 
And that's why he just stood and basically said, I can see you. I'm not moving because I know you're there and looked in their direction. So that was really amazing to see. And I'm pretty certain that that giraffe still stands, the one from this morning. I don't think he ran into any trouble with those lions whatsoever. Carla, you know, every now and then we get pockets of giraffe, but they don't seem to be too prevalent up here. And I think it's maybe just because their favorite species of tree, um, well, well, there's not huge areas of it. A giraffe like to feed on acacia. And they also like to feed on buffalo thorn. They feed on, well, they feed on all different types of leaves, of course. But their favorite uh, tree is the acacia tree. And they have a very important relationship. These guys here are actually pollinators of the acacias, which is amazing. So as they stick their faces in between the thorns and use those long tongues to um, pull leaves off of the branches or the pollen gets stuck on their face and they transport that pollen to the next tree. Remember, acacias also have the, the tannins, the way that they communicate with one another via pheromones essentially and um, so the draft don't stay and feed on one tree for too long because those leaves get super bitter so they're encouraged to move off and go to the next tree to feed so not just insects and birds and things like that are um oh okay so yeah sorry um Ephraim was just telling me now that he thinks there's some elephants coming towards us so we've maybe found the herd so you, i think do you want us to come with you or are you happy for now Okay, for now he says it's okay, but that's good. So from here we'll probably go towards those elephants. So, you know, you often see them down near river systems where a lot of acacias grow. Um, Karen, yes, giraffe can most certainly charge you. I've been very fortunate to have never been charged by a giraffe, but I wouldn't like it. Imagine an animal that's, you know, is five meters tall, comes racing towards you at great speed in slow motion. So you might be giggling for the first little bit, but it won't be so funny when they are only a couple of meters away from you. And we were talking about it this morning. Those legs are so powerful. And one chop from a giraffe could quite easily put me in hospital, if not break my back, a leg or a bone for sure. Uh, maybe I'd be lucky enough to get away with some just some scrapes and bruises. But that I'd, then I'd have to be really, really lucky. Uh, they can kill lions easily, crush the skull of a lion. Not quite decapitate. I've heard many, many a story. Well, lots of books tell tales of giraffe decapitating lions. I can't say I've ever seen that in a documentary or anything, but they can most certainly crush an animal's skull. Remember, like we were, to we were talking about their weights, they're well way over a ton. They're way well over a ton, sorry. And those hooves are massive. I mean, they're, the hooves are as big as my shoe, but a little bit wider. And can you imagine with all that power stomping down onto the ground it's crazy i've had a horse do that to me and i feel like i've almost broken some toes and lost skin on my shins and um wearing riding gear too wearing gaiters and boots so protective gear and even that with a horse's hoof which is ways and cannot even compete with a giraffe so you can imagine one kick my goodness i think that would send you flying it would be serious uh, so then the lions know that they have to be of course careful so they're always cautious Okay, fantastic. We're going to go around the corner. Ephraim's very excited. We've got some elephants. So while we navigate again, I'm going to send you to Byron. Now, I just got to a little water hole. And it's this treehouse dam. And there's a beautiful reflection of this gray heron. The light is amazing. And it's just standing on the edge of the, the water. Now, these gray herons are are really wonderful birds. Now they'll feed on a number of various fish species we find in these natural water holes. Tilapia, uh, maybe even some catfish, and then uh, also little uh, mollusks, mollusks and worms that you get around the water's edge. They'll also feed on that. They're monogamous birds, so they, they, um, they stay in pairs and they nest usually using the same nests every year. Beautiful reflection, isn't that great? Makes for a very nice photograph. And a few other birds around too. There's um, Egyptian geese. Um, as you send those scans to the right, there's Egyptian geese and there's uh, the Blacksmith lapwings, the usual suspects, I suppose, for for a waterhole. These birds are often around a waterhole here in Juma. A 
Now, something interesting we did see was a a uh, impala walking away from this water hole, but it was limping. Now, that's not good for the impala. I'll tell you why. Because as the impala walks off and is limping, predators, if they are around, they'll see this. And they will definitely, definitely um, target that limping impala. It'll be a bit easier for them to hunt that impala. So easy prey. So I wonder if if uh, if it does bump into anything, it's potentially not going to not going to survive the encounter. Although we haven't seen too many predators by the lions this morning, haven't seen any signs of leopards around recently. But it goes like that from time to time. Um, for all we know. The leopards could be, uh, some of the leopards could have a kill somewhere and they're hiding or in dense thickets. Uh, now Becky, you were, you were um, speaking about uh, or asking about leopards and why there aren't any around and is it unusual? Well, you know what Becky, I think they probably are still around. We just haven't had, had much luck with them. Um, Oh, again, it's, it's, you know, it's seasonal, but also you must remember we've gone through a bit of a transition phase now um, in Juma. We've had some young leopards come through, um, if you think of Hosanna and Shungile, so they've potentially wanted to set up their own territories, especially if there's been a male leopard around that's shown up, then those, those animals, those other younger leopards will get out of the area and move move off into into um, different areas and try to set up their own territories. Well, not quite yet. Sorry, I thought I saw something. Just having a look along the ground here for tracks. No. Uh, um, so it goes through phases, but that's the thing, and we, you know we need to remember that is that this is a wild area, natural habitat. Animals move around; they can move wherever they like. So just because we're not seeing them here, doesn't mean they're not around. They're possibly just on the neighbouring property, um, but there's still so much to see and talk about. Um, even though it is dry, there's still a lot of interesting insects around. I know. Um, uh, Steve had that beautiful hairy caterpillar this morning. Taylor's had the interesting sight of those those dead ants. No, Eddie. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I'm sure the animals get wise and avoid the vehicles. Um, almost certainly, they. You know the animals. Sorry, I'm just scanning. I thought I saw some movement to some dark branches actually in the shade of a tree. That's all it was. Um, so any, yeah, I mean, especially shy animals and um, you know certain parts of Africa, leopards. Leopards are known to be incredibly shy and elusive. And if they hear a vehicle, they disappear before you can even see them. We, we're lucky with the leopard sightings we get here, but uh, other animals too. If they hear a vehicle, they tend to move off. Honey badgers, honey badgers tend to run away a lot. You don't see them that often unless they, they're used to a vehicle or unless they've got some food and they're not phased by the vehicle, then they're not going to move. But generally, they tend to run off. Well, I think I'm going to start searching for some more interesting birds, maybe maybe uh, another owl or two, and uh, I wonder how Steve's drive is going. Well, I do believe Byron is the owl man, and um, we haven't seen any owls, but if we did, we would come straight back to you with them. Definitely be your diurnal owls. But what we have here, not the best view in the world, but I was talking about birds earlier in their competition. And here we've got some Nyala that are... Oh, what's he doing? He's busy rubbing, is he? 
He's busy building up his neck muscles, perhaps. The purpose of horns in, in male, Nyala, is to, to compete with the females. And he uh, actually looks like he's having a bit of a belly scratch at the same time. The purpose of the horns is to compete with males for the right to females if that magical dance that we've seen doesn't work. And uh, as their camouflage or cryptic coloration works, look at that. They are invisible if they don't move. Believe it or not, there is an entire herd of Nyala in there. An entire herd. Now imagine trying to catch that. There we go. Now you can see him moving. Very slow, deliberate movements. The purpose for this little chat was not to talk about the Nyala specifically, but was to talk about how there was some impala as well here with the Nyala. And we were talking about birds earlier and their competition between the species. And so you have impala and Nyala hanging out. They're both mixed feeders. They both have the ability to feed on leaves when the grass material loses condition. But the Nyala, especially the males, have probably got just a little bit more of a reach than the impala. But then the impala are able to, they've got a split lip. So they're able to, to bite right down onto the ground. So they can get much lower than any of the other antelope when it comes to feeding. And that's specifically with grasses. So with the little grasses, you might have seen me pull out a little shoot this morning that the baboon was feeding on. That the baboon was feeding on. The impala is able to feed on those very small shoots that are very low down on the ground. And that is what gives them a bit of a competitive edge over lots and lots of the other animals. Okay. Well, we're going to carry on. We're following along the Mulwati drainage system on the eastern side. And who knows what might turn up. We're driving very slowly, having a look because you never know what you can drive right past like that. And this sort of system on the right is the perfect habitat for a leopard. And if it is not moving, we want to be able to see it. There's also apparently some bataliers nesting around here, hoping to find them on their nest. But we'll keep our eyes peeled for everything great and small. Well, we are indeed, Steve. Now, this is something interesting. That's a beautiful little antelope. It's a, a gray or common diker or diker, depending how you pronounce it. Um, the, the diker, beautiful a animal, a small antelope, not very, very big. That's fully grown. And that is a female. I don't see any horns there. But you notice there's something very white close to it. And it was actually chewing on that or, or trying to nibble on it. Now, those are bones. Now, that is very interesting behavior. Now, some of you might be wondering, why is it chewing on the bone? So, occasionally, a lot of the, the herbivores will chew on bone. And the reason for that is they, they need the, the nutrients. Um, to rock and uh, the reason for that is these animals need certain nutrients. So calcium and phosphorus is what they get from the from the bone. Uh, it's really interesting to see herbivores. They'll go and they'll chew on the bone. I actually saw it um, the other day with um, with the guest that I was on safari with. We saw we came across a big male giraffe, and it had a huge bone in its mouth. It looked like something from an impala carcass. It's busy chewing on it, and um, purely for the nutrients, it was feeding on it and chewing, trying to scrape off some of that bone. Now, that is known as osteophagia, the eating of bone, osteophagia. And an interesting behavior, but again, purely for nutrients that these animals might be lacking, especially now in the winter, when there's not a lot of good food around. Let's see if that Daka tries to... Now, do you see that? Probably little bits and pieces of bone around there. Isn't that interesting? Very cool. And also nice to see the daker because usually they, they tend to run run off and, and bound away through the bush.
Minamu, you asked which antelope species don't have horns. Uh, none. All the species in, in, um, that we see down here have horns. Um, but remember, occasionally sometimes the females don't. So, okay, so with the Dacre, the females don't have horns, but the males do. So all the species, the males will definitely have horns. Some species only um, the, the males have horns. Other species, sometimes male and female have horns. So, for example, the impala, only the males have horns. Dacre, only the males have horns. Stienbok, only the males. Uh, Kudu, uh, waterbuck, so there's actually a lot. Inyala, only the males have horns. Um, all those antelope. Uh, if we look at uh, the, the, the wildebeest, which are considered uh, antelope species, the males and females have got horns. Uh, what else? What else in this area that we see? Um, oh, now I'm trying to think. Now that's a tricky question. <laughs> um, an antelope we don't get here, but that is very prominent throughout other parts of South Africa. The springbuck, uh, that's our national um, antelope, our national animal, rather, not antelope, national animal, the springbuck. Now, they, male and female, have horns, both of them. So, um, what else, what else, what other ones? The oryx, both male and female, we don't get those, those animals here. So, those animals have horns, both male and female. Sorry, there's a lot of flies around. But in terms of species, every species here in Africa of antelope have got horns. And Carla, it is actually common for, for the dikers to be alone. Um, occasionally you'll see them in pairs, you'll see them in pairs, but, but it's not unusual to see a, a male or female by himself or herself moving through the bush. Now, there's that little hole in a tree up ahead that used to have a genet. And I'm not sure when last that genet was seen. I haven't checked it for a while. I don't know if anybody else has been checking this little hole. Let's see, let's see. No, no sign of a genet in there. Well, not today, anyway. I wonder, it's possibly still getting used. Also want to have a look. There was, um, I remember a while ago. Also found a little owl hole. There was a, um, a owl using a hole in a tree. Let's go and have a look there quickly. Too. It's just around here. See, those are, these are the little things that you need to look for while you're out and drive. If you haven't seen too much else possibly still going to find something interesting, especially the little owls, that would be great. Just having a look around here, uh, I don't think so. Let's check, this is a beautiful big knob thorn in front of us, quite dry at the moment, but there's some holes up at the top. And I have seen pearl spotted owls go in there. However, I do not see any sign of an owl at the moment. Uh, but I think um, I think we'll carry on searching for some of the smaller things around here. Um, but there's also big things that we need to look for. There are, and Baron. I'm pretty sure when you were doing your checks this afternoon. You shouted, elephants, yay, shotgun, meaning you were the one that wanted to find the elephants or relocate on the elephants this afternoon. <laughs> so we haven't had too much with our elephants. We did see one cow that was slowly feeding towards us, but we really weren't sure of where the rest of the herd is. I can't tell you how deathly quiet it is out here today. So we keep doing this. We literally keep stopping, hoping but we're only going to hear rumblings, we're going to hear a branch breaking, we're going to hear something along those lines. And we can't. It's just quiet, 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 quiet. So I have absolutely no idea where the other elephants have gone. 
it's bizarre. So I don't know if we're going to end up seeing them or not, but we're going to keep sort of trying. We just don't want to get caught in between the herd, which is why we didn't walk straight towards them in case all of a sudden elephants came up from around us. That would have been a little bit of a problem, and we could have gotten ourselves into a bit of a hairy situation, and uh, that's the kind of situation. Ah, typical. There's elephants on the damn cam. Thank you. Well, at least you're seeing some elephants. <laughs> Don't worry about us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And over to the damn cab. <laughs> ah, well, I'm glad that they're keeping you entertained. Well, that's probably where we're going to head. We also did see male leopard tracks coming through here. I suspect it's the same male leopard that was walking uh, all the tracks we had earlier, too, coming from Nyala Road, south, uh, Nyala Road North. sorry, And then they came up this way. So now we don't really know. I know Tengana, our resident boy, likes to hang around here. And sometimes he does move during the day too. So we've come out again onto a very sandy area, um, a spot where we know that Tengana likes to walk. But we can't see any fresh tracks. So perhaps he's just laying down somewhere because there haven't been any other reports of him. I can't say that I've heard any of the guides from Chitwa saying that they've seen him. There's no reports in Arethusa. Not that he really ventures into Arethusa very much. Little Gauri, no, none of them said anything. Didn't see anything on Torchwood. There, were a lot, there was a set of male leopard tracks coming from Torchwood onto the property. But, uh, yes, the wild goose chase of trying to find these leopards, it's, um, it's turning into something, isn't it? Carla, I, I suppose there's just not many prey species around. That's why it's so quiet in terms of um, and the cats. And I also think that the leopards are active not in the times that we are going out. It only makes sense because every time we hear any soaring or anything like that, it's normally from about 8 p.m. And then at about 5 o'clock it gets quiet. But through those periods, you can often, if you just go out and outside and you stand, you can hear lions roaring in the far, oh, very faint, but you'll hear them. And you'll hear the odd <laughs> rasping sound or you'll hear the whoop of the hyenas. It's very, very busy. But when 5 o'clock comes, it always seems to get very, very quiet. And often we, uh, we'll hear the leopards and things calling or animals alarming, literally just as we're about to, everyone's starting to wake up, you know, making a cup of coffee. By the time we get in the cars, you know, we just can't find them. And then I think it's also got to do with food as well. There isn't a lot of prey around that's sort of in obvious spots. So they're having to travel a lot further distances. Remember, leopards and lions aren't very successful hunters. So they have to make numerous attempts. And now there's a lack of food or it's been difficult to try and find the food and they're not being successful. It's tough. Tengana, we know at the moment, has come back. Uh, in full force and he's letting every single leopard in the area know that he's back and this is his spot and don't try and uh, and take well I know sneak onto the property I suppose so he's very busy remarking his territory and just making sure that they know Juma is his and he, going back onto Torchwood again in a force too so and I think that's because of quarantine who's um, been seen a couple of times down on, on Torchwood yeah I think that's really it anyways that should be a critter that I would find on a bushwalk, but it seems as though Steve has got it instead. Yes, I have. And talking about camouflage, have a look at this. I don't know how I spotted it, in fact. Look at that guy. A beautiful praying mantis. Quite nice and plump. Whether it's a female looking to lay eggs or not, I'm not very sure. What I do know is it's very, very beautifully camouflaged. And I was getting out the car to have a look at a track, and it scurried along the road. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen it. Really, really beautiful. And if, how close up on the eye can you get, Seb? Oh, that's the max. That's the max, eh? Um, I had a Sri Lankan guest years ago who was a specialist in dragonfly, in, uh, in praying mantids, and he took some photos of their eyes, and it was the most unbelievable thing to see. You can actually see it's in the middle of the screen there, the eyes, got that little white, that little red, uh, sort of black dot, and it actually follows you, that little dot. What do you want to try, Seb? If you want, you can try and put the praying mantis on a piece of bread and bring it close to the lens, yeah. Mm. I've got a um... oh, That's fine, we don't need to go any deeper than that. But he's got that little black spot, and the spot is really, really cool when you get to look at it up close. And actually moves with you, it watches you, 
you can almost imagine like a chameleon it sits very very still camouflage the eyes are moving although you can't see them moving and then as the prey comes closer those very sharp velociraptor like or the, what would you call those those rapier like talons in the front there grab down and grab whatever it is hooking it very very sort of tightly that no no Lou t-rex would not be able to clap hands if you, the, the thing about t-rex is if you're ever feeling a little bit down about yourself see he just said I'm not a t-rex man mm -hmm. thing about t-rex is if you're ever feeling a little bit upset with yourself imagine a t-rex trying to clap and it always give you a little bit of a chuckle but this one can actually touch the wrists together and then those sharp rapier like sort of appendages come down and that's what grabs their prey and then they'll munch on it they're very they're highly pre predatory feed in all sorts of insects obviously the the smaller they are the smaller the insects they feed on and the larger they are so i think this is still still a young species um, dragonfly ugh, why do i keep saying dragonflies praying mantids will grow from one stage to the other the youngsters look very similar to the adults until they eventually fledge or if not fledge but eventually metamorphosize into the final stage and that's easily seen by if you look on the back here you can see sort of the, the makings of what looks like a wing but it's not yet the wing an adult praying mantis will have will have wings to enable to fly until that stage they are mainly walking around and grappling feeding until eventually they get wings and that's when they're at their adult stage and that's when they'll lay eggs so I don't think this one is indeed about to lay eggs but I could be 100% mistaken mmm Bree Bree I'm sure a lot of insects like this are what gave science uh, science fiction novel writers and movie makers their ideas because uh, there's a very alien look to it except the fact if we think about it this is about as earthly as we get um, these things are all over the planet and there are some really crazy things that we all kind of associate with being alien but if anything they are perfectly adapted to their environment and perfectly adapted to everything that they need to do such marvelous creatures I do quite enjoy praying mantises okay well I'm going to collect him and put him back on the vegetation where I found him Willow, I'm not sure about that. Um, let me just grab him. He's holding on. He doesn't want to fall off. Let me just put him down very gently. Willow, I think they're a, they're a predator, not a scavenger. And um, an insect that has already died has generally lost most of, of the, the, what should I say, the volume, the hypolymph that you find, hemolymph that you find inside the body. And that's what essentially a mantis or insect eating things are going for they grab the carapace and they they suck the juice from inside almost like when you eat a prawn you're not really looking for the outside you're looking for the juice on the inside so dead a dead insect I think has lost the hemolymph and all the the life-giving nutrients that a praying mantis would be looking for but then I'm not 100% sure okay well going to carry on and see if we can find anything bigger than a praying mantis <laughs> well I hope you have uh, some luck Steve but uh, praying mantis is more than we've found so far I'm just jumping off I wanted to show you this tree quickly interesting tree I also wanted to see if there might be any insects on here now this is a a false marula that's what this tree is a false marula now, one of the ways you can tell is, and unfortunately none of the marulas have many leaves on them at the moment, or we probably wouldn't get to them, but with the false marula, these leaves come directly off the, the stem, whereas with the marula tree, the leaves have got a little bit of a, um, oh, what's the word, I've hit a blank. Um, they've got, well, it's a stem and then, the leaf stem, I suppose you could call it, which comes off of that and then the leaf. So these come directly, directly off the stem itself. So that's the one, the main difference between uh, the false marula and the marula. And also the bark is quite different. This uh, tends to get quite a shiny bark coloration. 
So it does look a bit different uh, to the marula tree. I've got some ants crawling around here, just one actually. So I'm just trying to see if there's any sign of any other insects around here. Um, something interesting we could potentially talk about. But no, it doesn't look like it. There's some holes in the side of the tree. Actually, this is interesting. Let me let me move forward quickly for you. Hold on. I'll show you this. There we go. Okay, now have a look at this. So, um, we've got, if you have a look, so parts of this tree has definitely been invaded by wood boring insects, wood boring beetles and that. You can see little holes through here. You might even get creatures like scorpions inside trees like this. We've seen that before, the Epistacanthus scorpion. They come and they burrow in and they wait for insects to walk past and then they'll grab them with their pincers. But if you look very closely here, there's actually some mud. Just on the edge here, you can actually... Oh, okay, okay. Hold on, it sounds like Taylor's found those large animals she was looking for. Let's quickly go across to her. Well, Ferg and I were just having a good chuckle on how the role seemed to have reversed today. We were sent out on a bushwalk to, find, of course, find the smaller things, but instead we found giraffe, and now we finally caught up with the elephants too. Whereas we've got Steve looking at praying mantises and, uh, well... Byron off of his car, checking out an ant. I believe he just had one on the false marula. So, <laughs> pay all the bustling insects there. This must be the quietest herd of elephants in the whole of Africa. It was not a small group of elephants. It was a fairly big group of elephants. I uh, had a drink at the pan, and I know there were some more that were having a drink at the pan. And every now and then we, we hear them, but only as we've got this close. There's definitely some further down in the drainage line this way. And then, of course, that group over there. We don't know how many are actually bundled up together. That's very nice. That's so pretty. All the dust that's being kicked up. And they're just feeding very, very, very sort of quietly. Now, we have got a big drainage line in between us, so that's quite nice. It's always good when you are viewing big mammals like this on foot to always make sure and be aware of your surroundings and always have an escape route. Um, you must never become arrogant and think that you don't ever have to you know constantly think that uh you know that um oh sorry i just lost my train of thought there for a second ah what was i saying what i was saying is you must never get so arrogant that you think that you can just walk and still not have you know a sort of backup but uh very very cool they're very far away from us I don't think we're going to do uh, go too close to them. We probably won't stay here very long too because they are being quite quiet and I don't know where most of the herd is. So we don't want to get stuck in between this big breeding herd and they're not all grouped together. So there's actually no way around us here. We're going to have to do a massive detour to try and get to the other side or go back the way that we came because I can't just follow the pathway and walk straight through those elephants. And I know that there's elephants to the left of those ones and most likely some further uh, to the right of them too. You see, they're all coming out in the same place after a nice drink. Now they're just feeding. Like I said, they always after a drink will just go and do a bit of feeding and sort of slow the pace down. So they actually haven't moved very far from the dam at all. If we'd come straight from the dam, we didn't really know though where they'd gone and um, pretty much head, headed east from the little pan. I think we would have found them within the first 20, 30 minutes of drive. We took the scenic way around and it really paid off this afternoon because we got those giraffe. I don't think we would have seen those giraffe if we'd done it the other way. But this is awesome. Zach, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking loudly, but I'm also not speaking very quietly. And I don't think they know that I'm here. Oh, do you want me to, so Ferg wants me to go forward. No, 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 it's okay. What I do, what I do want to do, now, the wind where we are is most certainly going to be very different to where the wind is of the elephants because we've gone down in a drainage line. Swirling a little bit, but we've got the wind in our favour. 
We knew that as we were coming towards it, which we were quite excited about. If we'd approached from the other side, the elephants would have smelt us probably straight away. It will change as you get down into the drainage line. I don't know what direction it will be blowing around, because remember, it's, you've got to take all the vegetation into account. It's sort of very, very sheltered down there too. Um, so yeah, that's very nice. I'm glad we got to find them. Everything actually paid off this afternoon. And I know, I know, like I said, Byron is excited for elephants. I don't know where he is, but perhaps he wants to come and view them. Now, Josh, with elephants, they obviously be quite large creatures and they live for a very, very long time. So, uh, typical lifespan of an elephant, about 60 to 70 years, somewhere around there or so. But again, it also, it, it, it's got to do with their teeth. So, they've only got a certain amount of molars that come through and they say every 10 years or so, they'll get a new set of teeth and they have, typically they have six sets of molars that will push through in their lifespan. So... You can imagine, in 2015 and 2016, the elephant's teeth would have taken an absolute hammering and would have would have come down and um, quite a bit because of the drought. Vegetation was really unpalatable. It wasn't very nice. Wearing those teeth down a lot quicker, a lot more hard on their teeth. Um, so that's of course, is going to shorten their lifespan. I, it was only a two-year period, so I don't think dramatic, you know, drastically it would have had a, a serious effect on them, but it definitely would have worn their teeth down um, a little bit quicker. Very cool. Wonderful. Okay, well, we're going to move away from these elephants now just because don't, we don't know where they all are and they're being super stealth-like, but Steve has got a feathered friend. Yes, we're trying to get you a friend. He's just moved back into the bushes there. There's a bit of a bird feeding party happening here. I'm trying to get them all to come a little bit closer. <laughs> There were a few coming through. We're getting quite excited at the alarm call. And now it appears as if they've become very shy. <laughs> it happens. Maybe I wasn't doing a very good alarm call, Seb. Oh, there we go. What is that? That looks like a... Uh, what is it? Ah, oh, that is a... What is that? I didn't quite see. It was very small, though. I wonder if anybody got a look at that. Screenshot it, please, if you did. I didn't get a look. It almost looked like a rattling cysticula, but it also could have been something else. Here we go, here's a little... They're going to come. I'm sure they are. There we go. There's the crombeck. Crombeck is in the tree there. The long-billed crombeck. <laughs> they're very small, and they've got no tail. Very long, curled beak, or should I say just a little bit recurved, and no tail. Make it very easy to identify the long-billed crombeck, if it, at all you can find them. They are quite tricky. There's that flycatcher at the back again. Seb's landed on that small branch at the back there. There it is. I think that's the branch left. Yeah, that branch there. Oh, no. Up on the top of it, yeah, on the top of it. There it is. That looks like a fly catcher to me, folks. I wonder if anyone out there is familiar with their fly catchers. Quite a common one in this area. Very sort of characteristic eye shape that they have. A little bit of white around the eye. It's definitely not the spotted flycatcher because they are, they are what we call migratory. I wonder if anybody knows. The chest is quite unstreaked. It's not very pale in color. It's a little bit off-white. He's not looking at us very well, is he? Pale grey on the back. A little bit of white around the eye. You can see that. Oh, you saw his chest had a little bit of streaking on it. Was indeed. There we go. Maybe we get him again. Oh. <laughs> that doing. There he is in the middle. 
uh, doing that very characteristic fly catcher just slightly off right of the screen there so there we go there we go no no streaks clearly no streaks on the chest make it quite difficult to identify Sam, that was the guess I was going for initially, and I can't think of any other one due to the time of year and where we are, but it doesn't have a very streaky chest, but it was the fly catcher I was going for, but um, without it looking at us for too long with its chest, it's hard to really have a look. What bird in the book is similar to the dusky, and we will have a look. And the spotted, no. You don't get the spotted here this time of year. So it was probably the, the African dusky with not a very streaked chest today. It was just in a little bit of a, of a breeding plumage change. But a very nice little bird party. I'm you'll be sorry you weren't able to see a lot of the birds. We had a red-headed weaver. We had a crombeck. We had some forktail drongos, which are pretty much all over the place. And uh, a, a flycatcher, which we're going to probably go for. Bri Bri and say dusky. Okay, well, on we go. Cassie, wow. Okay, well, that's a question I don't 100% know the answer to. The difference between African flycatchers and flycatchers around the world. I think what ornithologists globally have tried to do and it's a reason why there's been a lot of name changes in the birding world is to try and make or homogenize the birding classification so that birds that are called luries are in the same sort of classification as other places in the world so I would assume hence why kingfishers here are the same as kingfishers elsewhere robins are the same as elsewhere I would assume that the, the king the the flycatchers we get here are probably similar to flycatchers elsewhere. Um, due to name changes, would bring them all into the same sort of family. But I would have to look at some scientific names to tell you for sure, because um, there was quite a disconnect, disconnection in the world for a long time. And <coughs> the ornithological community is, has really put a lot of effort into to bringing all these names back together. And it really annoyed a lot of people in the early 2000s because of all the name changes. But, you know, that's when I started learning birds, so it did quite well for me. <laughs> well, it seems as if Byron has found a bird that is not the bald eagle. Definitely not a bald eagle. Beautiful fish eagle, and they just took off, saw it swooping down, but there is still... Um, one close to us in the tree very close to us in fact so a pair now the, the, the male and female fish eagle actually look very similar um, the female is a bit larger than the male look at those talons incredibly sharp oh, it's a beautiful view of it in the afternoon light now um, actually just before they move in sorry I want to show you something i'm just going to move forward quickly we've got some hippo out of the water they've probably been basking in the sun warming up and deciding to move back and we are down at chitra chitra dam where all the hippo are it looks like look at that awesome there's a yawn by one and have a look interesting look at all the ox peckers covering these those hippo hey the hippo have got a lot of scratches on their backs they do have ticks but a lot of scratches from fighting and biting one another and the ox peckers we know feed on the blood so it's a perfect opportunity for them to to get to to those scars and pick them open and drink some of the blood off of the um, or from the hippo, and you can see them. Very small legs for such a huge animal. Isn't it strange? But don't let that fool you. They can move very, very quickly if they have to.
Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that great? That was a perfect, perfect view of that hippo. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, Robin, you say someone get a towel for those river horses. <laughs> There's a cool little bird that I haven't, I don't think I've seen it on Safari Live before, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I want to just show you, it's just running on the ground. Um, can you see it there? Senzo, there we go. It's an African pipit. There it goes. That's a nice little bird, something different. I mean, these little birds are quite obscure and difficult to identify but that is an African pipit. I like to sit on the ground with that slightly orange beak <laughs> tricky to follow them isn't it That's really nice. Uh, well, it's always great to see the little birds around. I did see one or two scaly feathered finches. I think they were around, running and jumping around. Some grey-headed sparrows. Uh, Destiny, um, you asked about those birds on the hippo. Um, those were the oxpeckers. And, um, and they're the ones that pick off the ticks. They often sit on uh, on most animals or herbivores that are out of the water. Not <laughs> not the ones out the water. I mean, okay, when the hippo come out the water. <laughs> <laughs> the hippo come out of the water and the oxpeckers like to sit on them but all the other animals that aren't in the in the water the herbivores that are on, on land the oxpeckers sit on them too rhino buffalo uh, giraffe most of the antelope species the oxpeckers sit on them and pick off the ticks <laughs> um, another interesting little creature I've just spotted have a look just on the bank I'm across from us um, Oh, there's, there's two. Oh, wait. That's a, that's a baby crocodile. No, that's not what I spotted at first. Senzo spotted that one. But oh, hold on. There, there's a, there's a, a little monitor lizard. Lower down. Okay, those are the water thick knees. Just to the right, Senzo. Just to the right. There we go. There we go. Oh, no. Also a baby crocodile. That is tiny. I honestly thought it was a monitor lizard. That is so small. So a few baby crocodiles here. That is wonderful. That's very exciting. So it just shows that the adult crocodiles that were here, they apparently did have a, a nest uh, at some point, I think the beginning of the year or last year. And um, to see that these crocodiles have obviously grown up in this waterhole and they're surviving. But, but that honestly, from where I'm sitting, it looks just like a monitor lizard. It's really, really small. It's not a big, uh, big crocodile at all. I was going to say it's a young water monitor. And if Senzo zooms out, have a look at that. Doesn't that look just like a monitor lizard? So two little crocodiles. And then that other one off to the side here. Lou says it looks like a baby crocodile to her. Yes, only because we've shown you, Lou. <laughs> oh, look how cool that is. I don't know when last I saw crocodiles this small before. I'm trying to think. I know at Londolosi I actually have seen um, in the river, in the Sand River, there's a lot of crocodiles around there. But but it's been ages since I saw a baby. Never <laughs> I'm 
Apparently a few of you have said you've missed my laugh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there's a little uh, pied wagtail, African pied wagtail. That's a lovely view of one. And you can see exactly why it's called wagtail. I'm not very good at demonstrating the wagtail. <laughs> There's always so much going on at this dam. I love sitting here. I just heard that little call from the wagtail too. Well, it sounds like Taylor's having a lot of fun on her walk this afternoon. She's still with those large pachyderms. We're tiptoeing around them at the moment, actually. We keep having to find a gap to sort of sneak through. So every time we think the coast is clear, we're able to make our way through and get in the direction that we want to get. See, she's that elephant is smelling us now. Maybe heard us and then doing a bit of a reassurance thing where she puts the trunk up. Or maybe he might be a young boy. Now nah, it looks like a female. I see that elephant has not picked up on us. We were trying to avoid it. But also think that that elephant can maybe see us from here. We still got the wind in our favor, so I think this Eddie will be struggling to smell us. But it doesn't seem too bothered. Still sort of munching away on some knees. And if the elephant had a huge problem with us, it would have trumpeted, it would have mock charged us, or it could have just removed itself from the situation and walked away. But it doesn't seem to be too bothered. We'll see now, watching it. Maybe it's a young bull, I don't know. Minamu, yes, elephants do fur. Can you quickly take two steps just to put a bit of cover? Just watching her. Sorry, Minamu. Yes, they do eat they do eat dry grass. I just want to watch this elephant. Let's just see, let's just watch it. Sometimes what elephants will do is they, it's coming on, they'll pick up on your scent, very much like white rhinos do this, and they'll end up tracking you. Elephant bulls do it a lot. I wonder if it isn't maybe just a young bull he's picked up. I'm not, I'm not concerned. This elephant doesn't have a young calf at its side. It seems to be away from the herd, which is why we were standing waiting in the drainage time, because we always talk about satellite parties. So you need to make sure that when an elephant herd is passing by, you remember that there could be some elephants further ahead than the bulk of the group and then some further behind. You must remember that. You mustn't get too excited and uh, and charge off thinking, oh, the herd has passed, because that's when you also run into a bit of trouble, so you've got to stop, and that's what's happened here. I just, I don't know, it might be a young bull. But sometimes they'll come and they investigate and they come closer, and they're quite curious animals. A young elephant bull, very curious, and I guess they're not too stressed about it. You won't believe the power of, of our voices or even just clapping your hands and something like that. You really sort out most situations just with the tone of your voice. And remember, we are, we are still perceived as a predator. Can you still see it, Ephraim? Yeah, oh, under the big jackalberry, says Ephraim. So we're quite close to Gary Cutline. And I think it's just being very curious. Obviously, we're not going to go closer to it. We'll wait for it to move on. But we'll just keep all this vegetation between us. We've got fallen logs, we've got big trees. And once we feel that we're a safe enough distance away from, or the elephant has put distance between us, we'll carry on and then try and get out of out of here. You don't want to get stuck within a herd when uh, when it gets too dark. Okie dokie. That's fantastic. Okay, well, we're going to definitely try and move out of here now because we are losing light. So off we go to Steve, who has managed to find a hippo. We have indeed. We have back. We've come up to Buffelsook Dam, and apparently, it was checked last night. Was it last night, sir? But this morning? I was here yesterday. Oh yeah, probably yesterday. And Scuba Steve is back. I was there this morning. And ladies and gentlemen, Scuba Steve has got a friend. How nice is that? 
The grumpy, misunderstood hippo has got someone to play with. He looks much happier now, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, very happy. Very happy. <laughs> oh, my word. Scuba Steve, the most entertaining hippo in the Greater Kruger National Park, is giving us the stare down, Seb. The stare down. <laughs> I can't help but laugh. He's found himself a partner in crime. They're going to go off gallivanting this evening as they go from patch of grass to patch of grass. Raj, you think he's an undercover agent? Well, he's definitely doing a good job of keeping his body under the water. So, yes, very, very good as, uh, idea, suggestion. Scuba Steve and his undercover partner. <laughs> I wonder if they realize that it's not that cold outside. It's actually quite nice outside the water. Whereas down in uh, Chitwa, the hippos are already out the water, as Byron has shown you. These two individuals feel the need to keep themselves submerged until the final moment when they will go on a bit of a grass crawl. Not a pub crawl, a grass crawl. <laughs> To paint the town. A little bit too sleepy now to be listening to our conversation in too much depth. The way that they're positioned with their heads below the water, I can almost be certain that their heads are kind of resting on the bank. Yeah, Steve has got a friend, ladies and gentlemen. We, I don't know, it might be too preemptive to name him. So we'll just leave that for a few days and see if this semi love affair friendship continues <laughs> You've got something in your eye there sir I suppose that's the problem when you poo in the water you swim in all the time you're going to eventually get some of that grass in your eye I wonder if it leads to pink eye in the f case of hippos conjunctivitis in humans you often see hippos with very pink eyes. The females much pinker than the males makes it easy to identify. So you can tell these are both males. You look around their eyes and it's quite dark in color. The females wear very pink mascara and eyeliner around the eye. Makes it easy to identify. If he pops his eyes above the water, that is. <laughs> very lazy Friday afternoon here in Juma. Buffalsook Dam in the afternoon. Very lazy, very lazy afternoon indeed. Amanda, when I started, Scuba Steve was here on his own, and then um, there were six hippos in the water hole for some time. Ooh. Okay, there's just a little bit more potential conjunctivitis on the way. Um, and then there were six, and then that dwindled down to, I think, three. And for the last while, how long has it been, Seb? Do you even remember? It's been at least a month and a half, I'd say. It's just been scuba here. Last weekend, he was completely AWOL. We reckon he went on a bit of a golfing weekend away with the boys. And now it appears like he's invited a friend over for the weekend um, to show him how splendid his watering hole is. His friend is definitely having a look. He's not looking too excited, though. He's probably been off in, in greater pastures down towards Chitwa, where there's ladies and all sorts of things to talk about. And he came up here on the promise of some action, and it's just a little bit quiet up at Puffelsook Watering Hall. There's a, a total of two Egyptian geese, a couple blacksmith lapwings, and um, that is about the sum total. <laughs> but still a very important watching hole. This will be getting busier and busier as the time goes on. Mm, he's giving you the eye there, Seb. I 
Laura, that's a great question. Down in, I think it was, where was it? It was down close to PE, Port Elizabeth. They got uh, footage back in 2006 or seven, I think it was, of a hippo running around on the beach in the ocean. I think it was around there. Um, it could have been somewhere else, but it definitely happened about that sort of time. Um, up in the St. Lucia area, up in the northern uh, Zululand, sort of not too far from here as the crow flies, but there's definitely hippos living in the estuaries there, lots of crocodiles and hippos, and those hippos do make their way around the beach area, but they generally spend most of the time um, in the sort of in the estuary itself. The waters can be salty in places, so they move up and down into sort of the fresher areas, but they do feed on grass and there's there's no need for them to be running around in the ocean. There's nothing for them to feed on there. And they're not as you would expect them to be. They are not great swimmers. They walk along the ground. So they can only go to their sort of body height before the waves will probably inundate them and crash down. But when you have a skin that is susceptible to being burnt, you need to wet yourself from time to time. There we go. Scuba Steve's buddy is showing us a little bit more of a scarred back than Scuba himself has. Times of of competition with males and potentially lions from all over the place. There we go. That's what he thinks of my statement. He heard the word lions and he said, quick, duck under the water. Don't let them see us here. Robin, that's a great question. Um, I think Scuba Steve's the one on the right. His back is 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 not uh, not that scarred, um, and he's just a little bit bigger. But I could be completely mistaken. Um, this could be two completely new hippos in all, completely two new hippos. But I think this is definitely Scuba Steve's patch. So you just because of the area you're in, you assume it's the same hippo. That's a big male on the right. His back isn't that scarred. We see it quite often because he's often sunbathing with terrapins on his back. And it's, he's got quite an attractive back for a hippo, I must say. And uh, when I looked at this individual, there we go, he liked that statement. And when I look at the other individual, he had his back all the way out the water and he looked very scarred. Very, very scarred in comparison. So I can only assume that he is not Scuba Steve. And he's um, maybe a distant cousin or a friend from a watering hole down the road who I've said has come to maybe have a look. I don't think he would try and challenge Scuba for this area because if he did, they, they would not be standing so close and behaving so passively. Because um, hippos that invade each other's territory doesn't go down very, very well. They don't sit there and have a cup of tea and discuss things gently. They open mouths and cause all sorts of splashing and dominance and threat displays, which neither of these are doing. And in the words of James Hendry, the worst parents in the world, those two, the Egyptian geese. The, the long saga goes on about where did the goslings go? I think that's going to be the next novel written by James. Where did the goslings go? <laughs> I hope he's watching. I really do. <laughs> he might quite he quite might enjoy that. <laughs> and you can see he's um, doing a little bit of shimmying in the ground there. You can see their feet busy sort of disturbing the bottom of the ground and then feeding on all sorts of vegetation matter that gets disturbed. Well, enough of my waffling on about all sorts of things. Let's go over to Byron and see if he's got anything intelligent to talk about. Well, very seldom do I have anything intelligent to talk about. Um, you know, we haven't had much luck on Chitra Chitra in terms of um, anything else. That dam was beautiful, though. I, I left the dam. I thought I'd just... Um, basically check a lot of these drainage lines and thicker areas maybe you never know something could pop out but it was so nice to see that uh, those those two baby crocodiles I thought that was something very different the hippo out the water covered in ox peckers it's a lot going on there and those two beautiful fish eagles that are resident in that area 
around the dam. It's amazing. I can feel, now that the sun is setting, I can feel the temperature is dropping a lot. Um, and it's not quite chilly just yet, but, uh, but just about, just about. Magic Dragon Wizard, you asked, what do I enjoy most about being a guide? Well, I, honestly, I can honestly say it's, um, it's the ability, I think, to bring people out to Africa and showcase Africa and the wildlife and educate people on the wildlife in Africa and to um, just bring them closer to nature I think I really do I love I love that I love being able to do that it's a it's a huge privilege and I think even after this last uh, last trip that I did um, actually what day are we it's Friday today so you know what uh, almost uh, what, Friday today can't be two weeks ago exactly two weeks ago I was um, coming down the mountain um, in Rwanda after seeing the gorilla, gorillas two weeks ago at this exact moment we had just come down the mountain so um, you know that uh, that is an incredible experience there's a beautiful bird over there since a kingfisher brown hooded kingfisher there we go oh just took off there we might sit again Hold on, hold on. Let me just move forward for you, Senzo. I think get a better view. There it is. And there's nice light on it. Can you see it through there? Uh, there. Uh, it is there. Just go up and over here. It's a bit difficult because of all the leaves to focus on that little brown hooded kingfisher. But you caught a glimpse of it there. Nice to see you. Uh, um, a brown hooded kingfisher. Now they still around. They obviously don't don't migrate. They around and trying to catch what little insects are left. So I think yeah, they, all, all the all the the combination of all of the above is why I love guiding. And um, and I think um, I think also you know being out here is a lot better than sitting in an office. That's for sure. <laughs> I think, so sorry, I I couldn't uh, hear the name properly. Um, Chris. Chris <laughs> Sorry, I'm not loving. I'm loving Louise Crisly Top. I think Crisly Top. <laughs> Louise is struggling with the name too. Sorry, this is confusing me a little bit. <laughs> if we get straight in this, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> I'm like, it looks like I'm skewed. Um, so Crisly Top, you asked, is there any, any. Um, uh, um, organ in the bird that helps uh, with balance now I know the tail obviously plays a big uh, a big role in balance for birds um, in terms of internally I don't know actually I don't know I mean they always say our middle ear helps us with our balance I don't know well, however that, that works um, but I don't know with birds to be honest I don't know I just know the tail plays a huge role in balancing and count countering the balance of the uh, of the birds I'm not sure if there's anything else I haven't heard of it I haven't read anything about it we may have to um, ask a few people to research and let us know if they if they know of anything else that helps a bird with balance Now, it seems like a perfect temperature now for animals to start getting more active and moving around. So, um, so perhaps 
we are lucky and we find a pangolin. What about that? That would be cool. Um, well, I'm going to search for a pangolin. Uh, I wonder, wonder what the rest are searching for. Well, pangolins would be fantastic, Byron. Anyway, I'm going to do a little segment with you, ladies and gentlemen, today, which is going to basically be a bark segment. And the, the statement is, can you identify this tree? Are you barking up the wrong tree or are you barking up the right tree? Have a look at the bark. Seb has got it nicely framed and shot for you. I'm going to try and come out of the way. Have a look exactly how he's framing it there for you. Very easy to see how fissured it is. Don't worry too much about the lichen growing on there. It's very brown in color normally. Oh, sorry about that. It's very brown in color. That is lichen that you can see growing in it. But the grooves are very fissured, very deep grooves. We do get them all over the place. I wonder, hashtag Safari Live or post on the Twitch on the YouTube stream, if you can identify this tree from its bark only. Hmm, are you barking up the right tree or are you barking up the wrong tree? Seb's given you a very nice sample there. You've been able to see one or two leaves, so if you have seen them, well done. If you haven't, well, I'm terribly sorry. How many of you out there are good at identifying your trees? just via the bark. Sammy Jane is not a dogwood. No, just because I'm talking about barking up the wrong tree and the right tree. I'm going to do quite a few of these over the next few weeks and we'll see if we can identify them just by the bark because with the right book you actually can identify many trees exactly by um, the, what they look like because in the forestry industry um, many people need to actually identify the trees because you can't see the top of them. So sometimes it needs very close inspection, just like when looking at very small raptors. Oh, look at this. Now, this morning we had a bird which was confusing us for a while, but this, without a doubt, is a shikra. Beautiful little acipita, but we confirmed when we got back to camp it was a shikra we saw this morning too but here you can see the banding very very clearly down the chest and belly those reddish eyes look at it peering through us uh, at us now and then have a look how interesting this is the behavior it's balancing on one leg you see it's actually got one leg tucked in you see that very interesting now the birds do that look it's tucked right in under the feathers now the reason they do that is for warmth so the birds will sometimes tuck their legs in under their their, um, their feathers so that very little of their body warmth escapes so they're conserving heat isn't that clever so they'll tuck their legs in one at a time still balance perfectly with one leg that's such a beautiful view of it. The light is perfect now, and you can see those red eyes. You can see that yellow sear. The top part of the beak is called the sear, spelled C-E-R-E, -E, and then um, the yellowish legs. But perfect, perfect view of the shikra. I love seeing these little birds. Okay, well, this bird is perched beautifully in a tree. And speaking of trees, I think let's head back to Steve while he's barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> Thanks, Byron. Thanks, Byron. Well, I wonder how many of you out there are able to identify this tree specifically from the bark. Um, it does take practice, but it is a good identification feature if you... Obviously, if you're looking at the bark there, it gives you quite a good indication of the characteristic of the tree. And then you want to identify a tree. You can't just take a leaf and bring it home. Um, it's also important to mark out the shape of the tree, the bark, the coloration of the bark, uh, where it was growing. Those are elements that in a tree book would help you identify a plant. Bringing back just a branch or a leaf, even if you brought the fruit with it, sometimes 
you can't 100% uh, guarantee the ID. It might be slightly different from another species, and this feature could help you identify it correctly. So I wonder how many of the viewers out there have got any idea. Curious one, it is not a leadwood. No, it's not a leadwood. A leadwood would have been way too easy to start today. If we started with a leadwood, it would have just been like, oh, let's not do this again. But this is to make people think. Um, it is not easy, but um, once you know it, and once you've spent time with this tree, it's very easy to identify it through how deep and fissured that bark is. And the fact that there's a lot of lichen growing on it as well is sometimes also a characteristic feature with this plant because they quite often grow in quite dense sort of stands or dense vegetation and they are a, a, a remnants of the forest biome. You do find these still in the forest biome. Um, they turn into more of a climbing style creeper and uh, we have two species of this kind in the area. This being <clears throat> although the name might not say it, the less common of the two. I'll give you another moment or two to figure it out, folks. Mm. Listen, Bri Bri, you are thinking along the right sort of lines, but um, the Tamboti has got sort of much sort of smaller bits and pieces of the bark there. Definitely underneath the same sort of idea of rough, but more blotchy rather than fissured. These are long, I'm going to try and move away past without getting in the way. But these are fissures here. You can imagine, uh, you here, Seb? These are fissures. These run like canals down, very long canals, whereas the Tamboti, it's like like blocks, similar to the leadwood, blocks and pieces on the bark itself, almost like a puzzle piece put together on there, where these are long fissures, easily identified, but maybe not. Okay, are we ready for the big reveal, ladies and gentlemen? Seb, you can... Oh, one more. You are stumped. <laughs> Who is that? Who is that? That's funny. That's funny. Okay, well, Seb is going to... Uh, that was Lou. Lou, very good. So if we look right in on the leaves now, you'll be able to see that there are spikes or thorns on here. Lots of spikes and thorns, and there's a leaf. Are you with me here, Seb? Yep. There's a leaf growing off of that, just at the base, and it's got quite a green coloration to it. Let me maybe grab a couple off. There we go. Have a look at that over there. Quite leathery, quite tough. It is edible. To an extent, ladies and gentlemen, the common spike thorn. We have you right here, common spike thorn. So that is the first of the barking up the wrong tree. Um, Paula, bark is not easily digestible by animals. Um, the outer bark of a tree, this very, this very outer outer bark here. Is, is dead. There's nothing there to be eaten or digested. That is there purely as protection and as defense against fire and against being eaten through insects or whatever. Um, when you want to eat the bark, what the animals are doing is that it's the inside cambium layer, the layer that's right up next to the wood that is there and it's often protected by the bark. So if you damage bark, you'll often get that moist layer inside. That is where the water is bringing the nutrients up from the roots into the leaves and that's also where the leaves, the sugars, and all the nutrients that have been processed into food are then transported down through the plant. So that is what's eaten and digested by animals. This itself, no, not really, but that goes back into the system as organic material. And if you're watching this morning, a very important environment for all sorts of organisms, especially scorpions on the ground. So I hope you enjoyed that little segment. Um, a quick little look at this book that I've got here, a quick one so no one can take screenshots, is that they are lots and lots of trees identified purely by the bark. Well, I'm going to put that away so no one can cheat next time. <laughs> but I hope that entertained you all for a little bit. It definitely got the minds thinking. It definitely got the minds thinking. But um, you can see how just through a bark you can identify a tree. You might not get it 100% just by the bark, 
but it'll definitely define one versus the other. There's a very similar plant here called the red spike thorn that you can get confused with, but that bark is a complete giveaway in the difference between the two species. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Came to me in a moment of, of thought last night. Was it last? I think it was the night before. I wanted to do it yesterday, but I forgot my book. Well, should I say my book got uh, water damage? So, yeah, I need to get <laughs> need to get another one of them. Water damage from my leaking backpack. That's okay. Books are to be used. Ideally, we don't want them to get damaged by water, but it does happen over time. I think it's almost getting time for a layer, Seb. Who was that, Lou? Linda. Linda, a regular feature. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. Add it to a week, one a week. And there's not that, there's, there's quite a few trees out here, but there's, and there's a number of different bark types. So we're going to go through them and maybe one a week might be a nice way to, to sort of familiarize ourselves. Just the leaves and the thorns and the pods for identification. Is that some green pigeons up there, Seb? I think it might be. I think we might have ourselves a family of one of my favorite birds. Oh, wow. We've got green pigeons on the left and uh, doves on the right. So what a marvelous afternoon. So there they have them. They are busy grooming away from the nest. This is the important time to be cleaning yourselves of any parasites away from the nest. I've said this saying before, if you ever go home after walking on the beach with all the sand on your feet and climb into your bed, you'll know that is not a good idea. You'll only do it once, sometimes twice, but you know it's not a great idea. So they're busy grooming and getting all the different fleas and flies and not flies, but uh, lice and whatever there might be in their feathers out and that poor little tree is getting the brunt of it as it all falls down below them and then they'll fly off to wherever it is that they're going to roost for the night because the sun is setting it's going to be getting cold soon and it's definitely time for the bushwalk team to be heading home and time for us to be putting on a layer or two Seb don't you think mm -hmm. yes. a little bit of a little bit of down feather perhaps to yes. keep us warm Okay, well, we're in the dip. Someone else has got a perfect view of the sunset. Oh, we do indeed look at this. How beautiful is that sunset? The burnt orange sky, the burnt orange African sky, and the silhouetted trees. Probably one of my favorite times of the day. There seems to be a just a peace and quiet at the moment. No birds calling. Very, very quiet. Now, I haven't found a pangolin yet, but uh, but that's what I'm trying for. Do you think I'm uh, I'm stretching a bit too far, out of our reach? Perhaps don't know. You never know. Maybe we get lucky and we bump into one. See, I'm not sure, but I'm sure. All of you back home can hear how quiet it is. There's honestly not a single sound while I'm sitting here. No birds calling. There's a there's a bit of a there's a cricket calling not too far. And that's about it. Uh, I can hear some hippo in the distance in Chitwa Dam. Beautiful peacefulness.
All right, well, let's see what we can find. Try hard. Maybe another owl. That could be cool. Another little owl around, perhaps. Like pangolin. That's, I'm going to set the bar right up at the top there. Let's see if we can find a pangolin. <laughs> that would be amazing. Really would be amazing. Now, to track a pangolin is actually really, really difficult. Um, I mean, out here on these hard roads, I doubt we'd see the scuff marks of a pangolin track. Very small, round little tracks. Not easy to find. Even in the Kalahari, where the sand is very, very soft, uh, tracks are not easily identifiable. And I'm also scanning on top of termite mounds. Perhaps there's, uh, there's a sign of a leopard. Who knows? Who knows? I uh, know it sounds like and Taylor's been having a lot of luck on her, on <laughs> on her feet today. <laughs> Let's go and see what she's found now. We've got a little bush bug. It's so cool. It's a female and she's grey. <laughs> she's got a whole lot of like white hair around her ears on her sort of forehead going right down towards where her cheeks would be. That's so cool. I wonder if she's just an old lady. She does go have very tattered ears a couple of next to that how cool is that that's awesome oh, i mean not all animals go gray but sometimes you see it with ah who said that eggsy louise sorry i'm talking to louise oh yeah sorry zander aka eggsy who is our in-house editor uh he said that he he has seen the specific bushbuck at our room, so it'd probably be a fairly relaxed one, which is why it hasn't run away, because typically the bushbuck out in the wild, they, their nature is to be quite shy and to hide away. You don't see them very often. But then again, it's always the most fa one of the most fascinating things is how the bushbuck are the first to become habituated around a lodge. That I don't understand. But really cool to see. I suppose we can walk up. Let's see. I mean, it's in the open. She knows that we're here. We've got nothing to hide. If Eggsy's seen her around the rooms, like I said, probably going to be quite relaxed. We'll just walk and talk. Um, she's seen it. Exactly. That's Fergus 100%. She has seen Zander walking around. What's there to be afraid of now? <laughs> I'm joking. She's trotting <laughs> out in the open. I think she's an old girl. I really, really do think that this is an old bushwhack. I'm having a look at my binoculars. Very, very grey around the neck. And even the way she was moving, she looks like she's like almost a little bit stiff. You know, maybe the arthritis is starting to set in now. She doesn't have many markings on her, from what I can see. Not too many stripes and things. Maybe it could also just be an unusual coloration. Maybe some form of a mutation or something in the gene that has caused all that, you know, different coloured hair. Very cool. Very nice to see, though. It's incredible how you can just go out here and you see all sorts of bizarre things. Right. Tiffany, now you've sent shivers down my spine because you've asked if the team has ever seen ghosts in the form of animal spirits. I don't want to, either. That would be terrifying. Imagine seeing a ghost buffalo. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it's, no, I can't say I have Ferg, I don't think has either. Let's ask, let's ask Ephraim. Ephraim, have you ever seen a ghost in the form of an animal before? No. Never. So you've never walked past uh, an elephant spook? No. Never. <laughs> <laughs> no, so no, I haven't. I can only speak for a couple of us over here. Um, but you know what? We do have some new employees and we like to play pranks. So maybe we're going to have to get a big white sheet and outline it in the shape of an elephant or something along those lines. <laughs> and do something to try and scare them. One of the... One of the things that we're going to do, and I'm so excited, um, as, as we, I'm going to tell you about a prank that I'm going to pull in camp. And so... As obviously Wild Earth is always expanding, we're always employing new people. And in the DRC, 
our rooms. Shall I draw it for you? Let, let's have a little drawing segment. We don't have much time anyway, so we might as well make the most of it. Use the shoe to smooth over. We had lots of practice last night. We were doing drawings in the sand. We could do bizarre things in cap. Okay, so... Okay, this is our table. This is where we eat. It's undercover. And then there's rooms all the way along on either side. Our bathroom is sort of there. And then the kitchen runs like that. Now, at one point before the DRC sort of expanded, this here used to actually be the kitchen. And it has since then been turned sort of into a room now. So we changed that. And we have a whole new kitchen sort of built over here. So Craig lives in this room. But on the wall, it's painted kitchen. And Craig's obviously gone on knees, so his door's closed. So what we're going to do is... Uh, when we get all our new folks that start working for us, we're going to say to them, especially at after dinner or something along the line, say, okay, right, we normally stack plates up in the scullery. It's just through the door where it's labeled um, kitchen, and we'll make some story up about how hyenas come through and wreck all the crockery and things like that. And Ferg actually gave the good idea of we should do it when Craig is actually there and give him a fright as they open the door to go put their plates down in the scullery. There's a, there's a room with a bed and all sorts of wonderful things in so I think that'll be quite funny to see the look on their faces because I can imagine they'll go, I'm pretty sure I, I walked in oh, to someone's panic. It'll be really good. Really, really, really quite funny, I think. We'll see, though. We'll see how funny it is. Who's been here? Deborah, do you think you said, did I once have a, a bubble floats in front of me once on drive? Did I? I can't remember. P possibly. I mean, some days I can't even rem I can't even remember what I did yesterday, to be honest. So, did I? I don't know if it was a ghost bubble, Deborah. I don't know. I can't actually remember that. Do you have a screenshot of that? I remember Karula blew a bubble once. That was quite cool. Well, who was that with? And was it with Jamie or someone? Well, she blew a huge spit bubble. I think she was having a... St oh, it was with Brent. Same, same. Um, so, <laughs> so that was quite cool, but no, that, I mean, that came from an actual animal. I can't remember having a bubble float past. That's bizarre. I don't know why I can't remember that. Anyways, how cool is this out here, though? This is not a breath of wind. The night is still a couple of Franklins calling in the distance. Very nice evening. Very, very nice evening. Now, as I stand here, oh, I see there's all sorts of insects on the surface of the water. You might not be able to see them. There's some mosquitoes. There's some midges. And I'm super worried because I don't really want to be bitten. Although the the chances of actually getting malaria out here are quite slim. Uh, there is a risk here. It's a low-risk area. For those of you that don't know, malaria is a parasite that is transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito. So it's not the male. The male doesn't actually feed on blood at all. And it's a huge problem, malaria. Like, it's a massive, massive problem. I was reading some statistics the other day that said that mosquitoes have killed, well, malaria parasite has killed more people in the world than all the people that have died in all the world, uh, in all the wars that all of well, humankind have been involved in. How crazy is that? That's, that's insane. So uh, we might have to start heading home, get a little bit of mosquito repellent, because I have been bitten the last few days. But... I don't think I'll be getting malaria. If I've got a hood spread, I've probably got a, uh, a bigger problem. Now, Louise, I didn't hear quite what you'd said to me. Sorry, I was listening to the sound of my own voice. <laughs> ah, there we go. Right, well, the light is fading. The sun has dropped behind the horizon now, so it's time for the Bushwalk team to say goodbye. But I hope you enjoyed another adventure with all of us, and we'll see you out in the vehicle tomorrow morning. Right, enjoy the rest of the show with Byron and Steve. Good night, Bushwalk team. I wonder what her practical jokes are going to be. You better be twittering, tweet, twittering, tweeting me and telling me. We've got a, looks like a stork or something flying there. What is that? What bird is that? Oh, yes, indeed. It is a beautiful grey heron. With the neck pulled back, which makes it easy to identify herons versus storks. Storks fly with their necks outstretched and herons tuck their neck back like that. That's good. Thanks, Sid. Sorry, he's flying behind. I just wanted to see, probably on his way to to Buffelsook Dam to go say hello to Scuba Steve. You know, there's apparently a Friday night party 
at Bivlesuk Watering Hole. Scuba's inviting all his friends. It's going to be quite wild in the wilderness. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, yes, well, thanks, Taylor, for your efforts this afternoon. Um, I'm very interested to know what practical jokes she's looking to play on all of us at DRC. Hmm. She's a naughty one, that. She's a very naughty one, that. So I'm going to assist Byron in his search for a pangolin. And um, hopefully while we're searching for the pangolin, we might find something else. But I don't know if Byron spoke to you about the pangolin he saw a leopard playing with down and oh there goes a purple roller we're we not going to get him though we might get him no we're not going to get him <laughs> he's 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 going we're going to get him Seb I don't think so oh if he goes into the woodland he's, oh there he goes well done Seb marvelous well there's the purple roller ladies and gentlemen and uh, a lot of these sort of dead trees you can see around us here provide the nesting holes for for the the roller species that we find as well as the hornbills we saw earlier the starlings they all prefer nesting cavities hole cavities created by woodpeckers and potentially enlarged by barbets and um, not the most commonly seen of the the rollers around here obviously we see the lilac breasted a lot more i wonder if you can all see it folks if you can't it's just kind of almost directly in the middle of the frame right now and he's got his back to us I'm going to play the call for you, and he might respond and give us a flyby. Let's get into that time of night where he's probably going to go to his roost. He's probably been doing similar stuff to what the, the birds were doing before. But he's definitely one of the my favorite to see, the, the purple. He's the biggest, and um, if you get him in the right light, the color is fantastic. But in the wrong light, he looks very dull and drab. So let's listen. It sounds almost like a chimpanzee. They definitely don't win the award for most attractive call, do they? But very beautiful bird. And I know we're not getting the best view of it over there. Not getting the best view, but let me show you one on my phone. There he is, all fluffed up and pretty. Beautiful eyebrow stripe. Beautiful purple and white streaked chest. And there's beautiful mauve, mauve and purple on the back. And that green, it's just all so beautifully sort of... In a, uh, integrated as with the lilac breasted road it almost seems like someone gave a child a, a, an outline of a bird and said color it in will you and they just threw together all the crazy colors but I love how it has worked for the roller species and they definitely win awards for beauty definitely not in the bird kingdom you don't get both you don't get beauty and sound doesn't work Very good. Haven't seen one in some time. We normally black-headed oriole. This sounds cool. Okay, <whistles> sort of like that. I know James was keen for me to do a black-headed oriole at some point. <whistles> but they do look. You know, I suppose. I suppose the black-headed orioles maybe got a bit of both. <whistles> Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Lou. It's just a little bit of a whistle. Black-headed oriole. I wonder what Byron's black-headed oriole is like. He's probably found an owl, though. But let's go have a look. <laughs> we have indeed. We definitely have. Senzo spotted this one. Look at that. A beautiful pearl-spotted owlet. Yeah, amazing. See those two very prominent black markings on the back of the head?
Oh, that's lovely. That little pearl-spotted owlet. Yesterday we found the African barred owlet. Now the pearl-spotted owlet. It's really wonderful. I must be honest, we spoilt with owls up here. Um, I tried to f find uh, some little owls last week, uh, just south of here on Londolozi, and it was very difficult. We found we found a giant eagle owl, but uh, none of these little ones, none of them. So we also really spoilt up here. It, I wonder if it's got something to do with the, the terrain and the vegetation. It's a little bit drier up here, it looks like it. Um, and I don't know if that affects the owl movement uh, or maybe because the trees are quite bare, it's a bit easier to spot the silhouette of the owls. I'm not sure. That's lovely. I did see a batelier also in this area. And it just settled in one of the trees, but I don't think we're going to get a view of it. I think it flew off um, further away from us. That is awesome. Another little owl. Ah, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I enjoy that so much. I really love finding these little birds and these little owls are my favorites so um, as Louise is saying now all it is left all that is left is a pangolin we found the owl now we need to find the pangolin <laughs> well let's hope let's hope some little bats flying around I doubt we'll be able to get them on camera um, very very fast and difficult to see Quite a number of different species of bats found in this area. Fruit bats and um, ins insectiv insectivorous bats. Now, um, I am um, speaking about a pangolin. I I'm quite jealous. A, a friend of mine, um, not too long ago, about a week ago or so, um, he works at, at Londolozi and they found a young leopard who managed to find a pangolin and was playing with the pangolin, trying to bite through the scales, couldn't get through it. But I mean, that is incredibly rare. Um, I've heard of and seen footage of lions finding pangolins and playing with them a bit, but never a leopard. That's a first for me. And they saw it about a week ago at Londolozi. I can't believe it. Um, and um, this, I'm sure they, they're going to release some more images, but I only got a glimpse of one image with this leopard lying, and you see the tail of the pangolin. Pangolin wasn't harmed at all. It was fine. Eventually, this young leopard moved off and left it. But, um, but what an incredible sighting. It's so great to hear about interesting little sightings like that happening all over, constantly. I mean, we, we heard and I, I see some of you found the, the footage and photographs of the kudu who was killed by hyena in, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, and one of the lodges in Zimbabwe. In the basically in the entrance hall, it was a huge mess. It was just blood everywhere. It looked like a murder scene, um, but um, you know it's just intelligence, I suppose, shown by the hyena chasing the kudu into an area where it couldn't run, and they were able to catch it and kill it and feed on it. But uh, I think uh, the lodge woke up to quite a shock the next morning. And I know some of you are asking if it was Hasana with the pangolin. No, it wasn't. It was another young leopard down down in the southern part of Londolozi. Uh, so it wasn't Hasana. Sorry, I'm trying to zip up here. It's getting a bit chilly.
<laughs> Madison, a pangolin would be nice, but you'd also settle for an aardvark. Ah, oh, so would I. That would be pretty cool. You never know. These cool temperatures. I'd, you know what? I don't know of anybody who's seen an aardvark in the... Um, what was that? That looked different. Hold on. Hold on. It just looks strange. A bird. <laughs> just a starling. Just the, the, I suppose, the silhouette, but it's a starling sitting up. There we go. Look at that. Just a strange, quick flight pattern, but beautiful silhouette of that starling. Um, I was saying, I don't know of anybody in this area that's ever seen an aardvark, a live aardvark, that is. Um, I've seen two dead ones. One was being eaten by lions, and the other one was being eaten by a leopard. So they definitely around. We find aardvark burrows quite regularly, and tracks from time to time. So they are around, but incredibly rare and I would assume that the aardvark around here are very very shy and very skittish oh uh, wow now apparently they did see an aardvark the other day and I was showing you images of an aardvark yesterday on and coral so I'll uh, our eastern neighbours, the, the the lodge right on the um, on the Kruger boundary, not far from here, a small property. They've also got traversing on torchwood and that, so that's interesting. An odd wolf, wow! But they, the odd wolf do also occur everywhere. It's just a case of finding them. Oh, wow. Now, apparently, um, a, a lot of viewers are saying there's alarm calls coming from the dam um, in front of Uyatela. Now, I'm a bit far. I'm going to try ahead there, but I am a bit far from there at the moment. Now, we heard alarm calls there today. Now, I'm sure there's been a leopard hiding somewhere in those drainage lines. Maybe there's something around. I'm not sure where Steve is um, at the moment. If he is a bit closer, but I'll try get there as quickly as possible. But I am a bit far away for now. Well, you see, that's the thing. I, you know, and I always say that uh, even though we can't, we, we haven't found anything yet. Doesn't mean there's nothing out there. There's always something happening in the bush. We might just be in the wrong area at that specific time. It really is a beautiful evening. Uh, the, um, just again, the light in the sky, the sunsets, the silhouettes. Really, really beautiful. Uh, Gromit, what extinct animal would I like to see? I don't know. Uh, uh, um, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I, it's so difficult. It's a tough question. Senzo, do you have one that you might like to see? An extinct animal? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I can't think of anything that jumps out at me that I really wanted to see. And it's, uh, so, um, Louise says she'd like to see a saber-toothed tiger. Yeah, I suppose that would pre be pretty cool. A woolly mammoth. I imagine those massive elephants. Woolly mammoth. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, let's, let's go with woolly mammoth. <laughs> I'm trying to get across towards the dam, but I'm afraid that by the time I get there, whatever is in that area would have moved off because I'm too far away. 
And if animals are alarm calling at a predator, it's not going to hang around, it's going to move away. So, unfortunately, we're just too far. if we can find anything else while we drive it. There's, there's a little scrub here. Um, Lauren, I think uh, uh, the scrub is just moving through the grass. Um, can you see it there? There it is, hiding. Very well camouflaged. Lauren, my favorite nocturnal animal would have to be, I think, the bush babies. We saw some last night, and uh, I love seeing them. The bush baby and the genet. Those definitely are my favorite nocturnal animals. They're really cute. They're little bush babies and the little genets. <laughs> Speaking of which, I can actually hear, sorry, since I can actually hear a bush baby. Uh, yeah, we can. I think Senzo wants to go into night. Cut. Sorry, folks. I'm not sure what's happening with Byron. We're having some difficulty with our IR setup, but we are have enough on to get going. I'm terribly sorry about that side. Okay, Byron's probably going through a little bit of a drainage depression. Uh, you okay, there, Seb? We are trying a new camera called the Fleur. Well, I don't know too much about it myself, but it's got a very interesting nocturnal spectrum. We were trying to put it on and it has been giving us a little bit of a hard time. So that's why we've been quiet for so long. We do apologize, but we're back with us now. And what was that? Ashy flycatcher calling off to the side. But what we do have is a beautiful male giraffe in front of us. Let's try and get around and have a look at him. Probably shortly with the infrared. There's a beautiful one on the, the right as well with the beautiful colors of the sky. Just moving through the undergrowth. Okay, so Lou, when you are ready, we would like to go to infrared, please. And then we'll be able to see these beautiful giraffe. You are ready? Let's go. Okay, so I'm just going to have to move up a little bit. This giraffe has just moved a little bit in the drainage here. Little one, there's one on our left and one on our right. There we go. That one's camouflaged. We're going to have one crossing right in front of us in a moment. Just off to the right there, beautiful young male giraffe is moving into the Umulwati drainage system. Beautiful area for them to be hanging out, nice green vegetation, deep roots getting to the water. Then just move up a little touch over here, maybe we get another look. Oopsie, hold on. They must be careful. This is an area, oh, there we go. There's the giraffe in front of us as well, moving in the road. A little journey of giraffe. If I can just move up a little bit, and get a little view of them. I love seeing them in this black and white. There we go, Seb, just in front there.
Yeah, definitely playing a game of hide and seek, aren't they? Another one in the road directly in front of us, maybe a little bit better. Actually looks quite nice without the light on. You want to try that again? That black and white looks beautiful. That's what we're doing now. Yeah, but without the, the IR light, it looked quite good, eh, just before? There we go. Look at that. Beautiful colours. Now only two metres to the left of where that animal is standing, the Unkuhuma pride devoured a warthog two weeks ago. Right there. I wonder if there's any residual smell that these animals could pick up. But no doubt the point of them hanging out in a small group is to avoid such predation. Well, it seems like Byron has managed to come out of his gremlins and he has found a very similar looking animal. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what uh, what happened there. We lost signal for a for a brief moment, but look, we've got a giraffe drinking. Let's let's see if it goes down again. Looks like it's been quite a giraffe day because I think Taylor had giraffe earlier and Steve had giraffe. So a lot of giraffe around. So funny, all of a sudden, just giraffe appeared out of nowhere. Nice big male. Beautiful to see them at night like this. It's amazing with the infrared camera or infrared light how we can uh, can watch these animals at night I can hear a very cool owl calling. Oh, Minamu, the giraffe do sleep. Um, they do rest from time to time, um, but um, but very very short periods of time. So what they do is they mainly rest lying on their on their bellies, and it's 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 kind of more of a rest than a, an actual sleep like we would sleep. I mean, even animals like I think the only animals that we really see sleeping, I think eyes closed and sleeping, are the predators, lions, leopards. Um, but yet they still completely aware and alert of what is around them. Um, are we, yeah, but but giraffe and elephants they also rest. But the thing is they will rest for a while and not completely sleep. Elephants will lie down and sleep from time to time. But giraffe when they're resting they just lie on their bellies. But they still keep a lookout for any potential predators. They have to. They've got to be completely alert all the time. So it's not really a sleep like we know sleep. I just want to play this owl call for you. Um, I think it's the white-faced scops owl. It's exactly what it is. Listen to this. Beautiful call. Now that's busy calling in the drainage line behind us. Um, pity. Let me show you. Yeah, it's busy calling. It's a bit far. I don't think you can hear it. But that's the white-faced scops owl, southern white-faced owl. It used to be, um, it used to be the white-faced scops owl. Now it's just the southern white-faced owl, uh, much larger than a scops owl. But look at that very beautiful face, and look, also feathers on the head like that. They can also thin themselves out to uh, to ca help with camouflage and blend into the branches and hide away. Oh, beautiful, beautiful little bird. But that bird's pretty big. It's about, so that owl's about that big, the white-faced owl. 
about that. So a decent size. And the last of the giraffe just walking past. That was fun. Something different, seeing giraffe at night. Well, we're going to continue our search for a pangolin or anything else that comes out at night. I wonder what strange creature Steve is looking for. Well, I saw something just here. I thought it was a pangolin, but then it ran away. Couldn't have been a pangolin because they don't run very well. well. I spotted some eyes, and they were very sort of Janet sort of like white tail mongoose kind of eyes but uh, just like that is disappeared oh well I got there quick enough so it definitely wasn't a pangolin because you would have caught the pangolin shuffling away in its very shuffle like manner um, I was uh, training last year and between the camps I used to train at I'd been there for three weeks with uh, an American group university had come through from Georgia <clears throat> University of Georgia they come through for a, I think they were with us for two weeks there actually and the afternoon that I left because they left sort of middle or about in the morning they left and I went across to the other camp and I, tra I trained that and that afternoon they found a pangolin can you imagine the look on my face yeah, I was not very happy about that. I was happy for all of them, but not for myself because I didn't get to see it. Marvelous indeed that they are still around. The most poached animal in Africa. True story. Very sad indeed. I did see one up in... Namibia. Oh, it looks like Byron has found a very nice nocturnal animal. I've found a genet. Look at this. A little genet hiding in the tree. Awesome. What a nice surprise. I wonder if the light will help a little bit. Sorry, Sam, can I just try? Yeah. I'm just going to shine there. Look at that. Just shining above it a little bit just to give us an extra bit of light. How beautiful is that little genet? One of my favorite nocturnal animals. See those ears constantly moving around, listening for p potential predators, I suppose, just to be safe, um, but also food. Rodents and birds. Um, and also feed on seeds and fruit. Fruit, nuts and mice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, my old joke fruit nuts and mice is basically the, the the general answer for anything whatever anything eats always have to add fruit nuts and mice but look how agile that little genet is also able to climb trees very very well this is such a great sighting. Usually they move off quite quickly. This one is being very cooperative and staying up in the tree for us. Possibly just woken up. That's why it's yawning. Isn't that beautiful? Wow, this is this is really special. Here it goes. at the beautiful markings on the body so those of you who wanted spots we managed to find some spots for you just in the form of a genet look at that beautiful tail now this is a large spotted genet it's got a black tip on the tail the small spotted genet has got a white tip so that is a large spotted genet and it just moved off wonderful hey how great does that awesome 
Uh, Chitty Chatty Meg, how are you? Wonderful to hear from you again. Um, and you asked, is a genetic cat? No, it's not. It's not a cat. It's part of a family known as Viveridae. Um, so, genets, civets, they are all part of that family. Not part of the cat family. Not felines at all. Even though they look like cats, they're not. Um, and that's the best I can do for you right now. <laughs> it's, it's just part of a different family called Viveridae. So, not quite. Look, if you go back, uh, no, I don't know. Maybe if you go back in the taxonomical hierarchy or, or, or rather taxonomical structure, they may be slightly related, but they're not, they're not in fact cats. So often some guides make the mistake, they, they'll call them genet cats and say, oh, there's a genet cat. It's not a, gen, uh, it's not a cat. It is a genet. It's not a cat. <laughs> that was really a wonderful sighting of one. Awesome. It's so funny. Sometimes speak about animals, and they appear. We, I mentioned that a genet was one of my favourite animals earlier. Um, Steve said he thought he possibly saw one run through the bush. And then all of a sudden, we we got to see one. Now I've been speaking about a pangolin for a while, but pangolin hasn't revealed itself yet. Right, well, we're going to continue our wishful thinking. I wonder if my friend is still thinking about other animals. We are indeed, Byron. We just heard some cackling hyena. Hyena. Apologies for the extra H. It is a South African thing. Hyena. It just sounds so weird for me to say hyena. Hyena. We heard them cackling. Just up here, we're not sure exactly. I have to turn around. We might have them in the road, we might find them. Let's have a listen, shall we? Can you become a kudu? Cup your ears. gone quiet. Okay, well maybe they're moving in the opposite direction. We'll keep driving along the road here, see if we can find them. The laughing or spotted hyena by that very cackling sound that they make. It's possible that they were just greeting each other or it's also a sound they sometimes make when they get quite excited and they're hunting or trying to sort of see off a competitor. I know Scott had a very nice sighting last year of hyena interacting with each other and the one female ended up getting a leg very badly squashed and an ear missing. It's quite a, 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 a hard video to watch in fact. Ooh, there's some interesting temperatures. <laughs> Everyone is distracted by my pronunciation. Well, all South Africans, apart from James Hendry, say hi, Hina, as far as I'm aware. Um, but it is not actually like that. It's just the way we say things in this country. And it is in me, it is part of me, and I find it very hard to not say it. I'm catching myself now after I've been, I've heard lots of comments about my <laughs> use of the word. Where are they? Doesn't matter how it's spelt, they are still cool animals to see. And there is a vehicle up ahead. I wonder if they saw these cackling hyena. If not, they're going to give us dust anyway. So we're going to switch off going and have another listen. Once again, become the kudu in the bush. Ideally, you don't want to become the kudu in that lodge in Mana Pools, because all that left behind was tracks of blood and bones. Well, there's some wildebeest 
on the clearings. It's so funny, we, we drive these areas all day and we don't see anything. Now watch these, these two wildebeest are chasing each other. I don't know why. So they've just run off. Possibly a male chasing another male. Sorry, I'm just listening. Wow, just the wind picking up. That's incredible. Just with the wind picking up, it's been blowing the leaves and the dry leaves at the moment are making such a noise. Almost sounded like something moving through the bushes. Huh. Wonderful. Um, and now, actually, you know, yeah. You know what, um, maybe sins, I don't know if we can do this, let's try, oh, that one might be a bit difficult, but um, over there, um, are we able to get the stars, there we go, that's a really nice bright star, that's Venus at the moment, uh, well not at the moment, it's always Venus, but at the moment we can see it, <laughs> and it's a nice view of Venus, I do enjoy stargazing from time to time, and then another one i don't know if we will be able to get this that one up there um oh there we go well done Senzo. so that's obviously the moon the big one on the left <laughs> um and then uh, that bright star over there is jupiter that is jupiter that we can see currently that bright one to the, the left of the screen there that is jupiter isn't it beautiful that one in the center awesome now the wonderful thing is if you're out there if you're on safari and you're with a guide if you um, at the right time of the year and you can see Jupiter if you take um, look how beautiful that moon is very very bright look at that <laughs> awesome if you take uh, your binoculars if you take your binoculars and you hold really really steady and you zoom in on Jupiter you will be able to see some of the moons now I think there are four moons that are visible to us um, with binoculars and um, they tiny little pinpricks of light right next to the planet so if you hold very very steady if you balance if you balance uh, on a vehicle or something and you have a look you should be able to see them well, I think that's it from us, but let's go back to Steve so he can finish off the show. Thank you very much, Byron. Well, the hyena sound like they've killed something. We're not quite sure. Uh, Aubrey, one of the other guides, he also heard it. He was in front of us moments ago. So we're moving in. And uh, the camera that Seb has been trying to put on is a FLIR. It's a, it's a, a heat-sensing thermal camera that we're going to be doing some tests with shortly and hopefully we'll be able to broadcast something in the near future but nothing this evening I'm just going to break up we have stopped moving it's possible they might just be greeting Are we getting here oh dear it sounds like uh, Steve unfortunately lost some signal let's hope he has luck I'm not sure what uh, what it is but it sounds like hyenas maybe maybe a predator killed something and hyenas are trying to steal it so we'll have a look if we have any luck we'll let you know tomorrow morning thank you very much for all your questions and comments this afternoon on our sunset safari hope you've enjoyed it i've had a lot of fun um, and i know um i think uh, from steve and taylor and seb and fergs thank you very much senzo thank you 
ladies in the final control, the voices in my head, as always, thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow morning on our sunrise safari. Good night, goodbye.